This is Deandra Beatty, and you're listening to The Bowler Show. Hi, this is Jackie Bowling, and you're listening to The Bowler Show. This is Jeff Riggles of Storm Products and The11Frame.com. You're listening to The Bowler Show. Hi, this is EJ Tackett, and you're listening to The Bowler Show. Welcome to The Bowler Show, featuring interviews with the biggest names in bowling today. Tonight, we're joined by the leader in USBC Open Championships information, Keith Dunphy. USBC Public Relations Director Matt Canazzaro, Brunswick Brands PBA Tour Rep and Brunswick Youth Experience Director Chuck Gardner, PBA Legend and Hall of Famer Bob Learn Jr., and recent USBC Senior Queens winner Jody Wessner. And now your hosts, David the Waz Wazwo and myself, Luke Rosedahl. Welcome one, welcome all to another edition of The Bowler Show, episode number five. Since we came back here in 2022, I'm your host, Dave Wazwo, alongside my co-host, Luke Rosedahl. And Luke, another action-packed show, uh, yeah. along with uh, along with some other things that have happened. So, something happened in the bowling world this week that you've talked about recently here? Yeah, a few Anything things. Like, I, I've been trying to sleep through most of it. or Well... As uh, some of you know, he, he wasn't sleeping yesterday, and he got a chance to get on uh, his page and talk for a couple hours about that. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that at the start of the show here, some of the, the stuff that's going on with USBC and with some of the bowling balls. We'll chat a little bit about that. Uh, coming up on the rest of the show today at 620 is Keith Dumphy. You guys know him as the moderator and creator of the 2022-OC Las Vegas page. Uh, that changes every year, of course, with the year. But uh, I had Keith on back in the old days on the show, and I thought he deserved a spot because he does an amazing job with with uh, what he does on there, with all the information he gives out. He does so much for that page and so much for the bowlers and saves people money, lets them know about what everything that's going on. I just thought he did a good job. So he deserved to be on the show, so we put him on, and uh, it's time to have him back on again, and we'll talk about what he's got going on this year at the US at the USBC Championships. Uh, once again, Matt Canazaro will be on at 640, and actually we're going to be moving Matt to 720 after this week just to kind of accommodate his uh, team event that's uh, finishing out there. So this week, this will be the last installment at 640. You will have to wait a little longer for Matt Canazaro's dulcet tones. <laughs> at 7 p.m., we're going to have Chuck Gardner, also known as Chuck on the Truck. He's running the Brunswick Youth Experience right now. He's doing some exciting things in bowling. He's always been one of the good guys in bowling. Had him on before, so we'll get we'll get a chance to ch- check up on Chuck. Uh, 720. We're gonna stay in that same same Brunswick family there. Bob learned. Uh, we'll be coming on. We're gonna talk a little bit about what Bob's doing nowadays. He's getting ready to head over the across the pond, as they say, to do some coaching in England. So maybe you can coach Stu Williams on how to uh, learn learn football, right? <laughs> uh, Stu, if you're watching, sorry about that, but uh, we'll, we'll uh, obviously we're gonna go. Go back in the, uh, as I like to say, the thrilling days of yesteryear of 1996. We'll check in on Bob's thoughts today of, of 26 years ago. And, uh, of course, you all know what happened when he had the big day, shot 300 on TV, won 100 grand plus, and uh, ended up getting the title. And then our anchor person of the day of this show today is uh, Jody Westner, 2022 Senior Queens Champion. And we've also had Jody on before, so kind of. Catching up with some of these people who are still in the bowling world and doing great things. And, of course, Jody's a storm staffer. We'll talk to her about some of the equipment she's using lately and uh, how she ran her way through the Senior Queens. And that is our show for today. We're going to have a, got a good, another good lineup, Luke. Now, uh, we were working hard on today's Masters champion, but that didn't yeah. work out. As, uh, as we know, it's not always easy to get those guys who had just won on Sunday. Yeah. But uh, that's the way it goes. So today's show, once again, is brought to you by Storm. Go to stormbowling.com for the best products in the bowling world. Uh, Luke and I would not be on the air without Storm Bowling. We're also brought to you by Turbo Grips, bobbyjacksons.com, Double J's Pro Shop, Cool Wick, and SRGBBFS. Hashtag Storm Roto Grip Bowling Balls for Sale. Yeah. Bowler's Mart, Cool Wick, whatever. Well, I forgot yeah. Bowler's Mart on there, of maybe, course. Maybe, maybe I mentioned that a couple times. I don't know. Yeah. There's so many of them. I mean, I'm wearing one of the quick shifts today, but normally I look like a NASCAR driver with all my. I don't have my. I usually refer to your sleeve for the. the yeah, yeah, initials there. The, yeah, the spelling of the. I'm getting that down though. 
the alphabet soup group on Facebook. <laughs> By uh, episode 20, I'll have that down where I can re remember seven initials. Uh, speaking of episodes, we will be here next week, or actually we'll be in the den next week. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, actually, no, wait a minute, we may no. be here. Yeah, yeah, we well, yeah, we're going to be here next week. We'll I don't think there's... Uh, Who's that? Who runs those Kansas City tournaments? Uh, I don't know. Mike Adamski and Dave Wazel. Yeah. Uh, speaking of which, I want to throw out a shout out. He's in in the chat right now. Guy who brought time. eight eight uh, teams to our tournament last week, the doubles tournament we had. Uh, Robert Gaming, you wanted to you wanted to hear your name on live live on the air, and uh, oh, there yeah. it is. We appreciate you uh, getting into the chat, and we appreciate everything you've done here recently. You've caught the bowling bowling bug down there in Nevada, Missouri, at Capri Lane. So we appreciate you uh, you doing that, and also programming note. Uh, Easter, um, where we'll be yeah. in Lawrence for uh, doubles on Saturday and singles on Sunday, which of course is Easter Sunday. We will not be doing a show, so mark that down on your calendar. No show on Easter Sunday. And Luke, I guess we've uh, kind of shoved this elephant in the room a little to the side for yeah. long enough. Uh, I'm going to kind of let you take the ball, no pun intended on this. Uh, I know you got to the point obviously where you felt like you needed to get on the air and dispel some of the, the junk that you were seeing on online, some of the rumors. And as somebody, I can't remember his name, but he uh, actually wanted to overthrow me as host of the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were kidding about that. that guy. He, uh, you, you did such a good job explaining it. And as you've done in your ball reviews and everything else, um, it's always been unbiased. And, and obviously we have an allegiance to certain people and certain certain companies, but sometimes you, you have to kind of tell things how they are, and especially when you're seeing stuff on Facebook that just isn't true. Um, take take a moment, talk a little bit about what you talked about yesterday for the people who were unable to watch. Yeah, so if you want the full version, I did a live stream yesterday. It's I mean, it's two hours, 15 minutes long, I think, but it's got, we talk about everything at length, all the, because it's a pretty confusing situation, but again, I'm kind of in the Jeff Riggles vein. I'm just going to tell it like it is, and if that's the, if that's not good for certain people, it, uh, sorry, but uh, that's just it is the way that it is. And if you don't tell it like that, then there's you know it's just going to cause more confusion and more misinformation and more rumors and whatever else. But if you want to go check out that live stream yesterday, I answer a bunch of questions. I talk about the the situation in general. The USBC partially banned six more storm bowling balls. Um, but they have an exclusion list, so you can't use them at the U.S. Open, the Masters, the PWBA Tour can't use them, uh, Pepsi tournaments, which are sponsored by USBC, Junior Gold, and Nationals, USBC Open Championships. You can't use them there, but you can use them for any other league or tournament that has not adopted the ban. That's where it gets a little tricky. So if you're going to any of these tournaments, if you go to Nationals, uh, the Storm Booth there will... Um, will replace these bowling balls. Now they're going to be busy. So you want to give them plenty of time. You can't just go out there a couple hours before your squad time starts and expect to probably get anything taken care of. Then you'll want to make sure that you get there a day or two ahead of time and, you know, go in there and uh, give them time to actually get you taken care of, but they will fulfill those at nationals. However, if you're like the 98 or 99% of people that just aren't affected, period, you can keep using them in leagues. You can keep using them in tournaments. They have a, they still, even though they're not required to offer you a replacement, they're still making that an option in case you want to do that. So there's something you can go to storm, uh, stormbowling.com. So, and that'll, there's a, I think that they sent everybody an email anyway, that they have email addresses for. It might be in your spam folder. It might be in your promotions folder, depending on what kind of email you have. But you can exchange them through Storm, even if you're not affected at all. They give you the option if you want to go on ahead and exchange them. Um, it will cost you shipping to send your ball back to Storm. But basically, they're, they don't have to offer you a replacement. And if you want to get the replacement anyway, all it costs you is 20 bucks for a brand new ball, basically. So I think it's a pretty good deal. It's a pretty crappy situation. And it, there's a, still a lot of stuff up in the air. But that's the story that we know now. The six bowling balls are banned only for these tournaments. Um, you can still keep using them in regular leagues, regular tournaments, whatever else. Uh, you can exchange them; it's an optional program. Um, that's kind of that's kind of the story for now. But yeah, there's there's a lot of confusion, a lot of rumors uh, as far as Storm, you know, making the mistake, or you know, USBC is the only one that can that is finding these test results, and 
Uh, uh, Randy Peterson talked a little bit about it on today's Masters telecast that was uh, that you should be able to find. Now, depending on what kind of TV service you have, it'll be up on YouTube tomorrow, I'm sure, on the Bosaurus channel or uh, some of the other stuff. But they did talk about it a little bit today on the show. I talked about it at great length on my live stream yesterday. So, you know, pop that on, put your pop that on at work tomorrow or whatever and put your headphones in. Or if you drive for a living, a lot of people do that, too. So uh, that's kind of the situation with that for right now. All right. Well. All I can say is I think something else is going to come out here real soon. Yeah. Um, I don't know what it is. I have no inside information, but I just don't think we've heard uh, the end of this, uh, even though I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm already ready to quit talking about it on this show. Yeah, um, it's, it's soaked up a lot of my time for the last couple of weeks. I can imagine because you, you're more in the know on that stuff than I am, and you kind of know what's what's going on with the exchange a little bit more than me. Uh, let's give a couple more shout outs here in the chat. We got John Halls, we got Chris Shipman mm -hmm. uh, back on Facebook. I just uh, just got him mm -hmm. back. And then, uh, of course, James Kniff. And anybody else in there that deserves a shout out that you see right now, Luke, while we're, uh, while we're perusing that, you and I. Oh, can, let me uh, see. We can talk about the show here when we get done with our yeah. shout outs. John, yeah, most of everybody. Steve G is a regular, John Lander, Jonathan Grislowski, Grislowski. Mikey, Ryan Martin, Chris Shipman, Clint Harris. Thanks, Clint, by the way. And then Jonathan helps to moderate our chat. Angel's kind of the, my wife is kind of the producer behind the scenes. Yeah, I haven't got a chance to mention it, but yeah, Angel is producing the show once again today. Uh, speaking of shows, we saw one today, as you said, on Fox. It'll be a great show. Being replayed, and we had all kinds of good stuff. Uh, unfortunately for our hometown hero, uh, Brad Miller didn't quite get it done. Did win his first match in exciting fashion. That thing's all over the internet right now. If you want to check that out with AJ Johnson, the finish of that. Uh, hopefully no spoiler alerts here if you haven't figured it out by now or seen it on Facebook. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. Cover, cover your ears. Yeah, cover your ears. Turn the show off now. If you, <laughs> if you still want to watch the show or don't know what happened, but in this age of social media, it's hard to, if you don't watch it live, you're going to find out what happened. So we're going to talk about it. Sorry. <laughs> if you're desperate enough for bowling information to tune into our show, then you already know what happened. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as we said, Brad, of course, here being a hometown Kansas City guy, we were really rooting hard for him. Yeah, unfortunately, for him. second match, he didn't get it done at, at the end. And uh, Anthony took took advantage, and, and Brad ended up finishing third. A great showing, though. And, uh, it, you know, for me, it's the toughest tournament to win because of the format. And we heard him yeah. talk about that a lot today. Luke, have you ever bowled any type of format like that before? Um, yeah, uh, Jeff Poston around here had a, uh, a double elimination bracket tournament that was 32 people instead of 64. And then it, I, I like the way that they have the, you know, the, the, the four for three match at the yeah. end where they have the four bowlers bowl for the last three spots on the, and that that's how Brad got into it. Cause I don't, uh, I don't know. I, I think that that's a really interesting way to do it, but it is kind of tough because some of them you can catch a Jacob Buttruff that shoots 791 at you when other matches are going like 560 to 540. So there is a somewhat of an element of luck, but at the same time, a lot of people didn't really score that well. And that's people associate score and bowling, how, how they actually threw the ball together too much. I, and I, I think that I, I'd be really interested. That's why I was kind of hoping that we get somebody on to talk about it. Cause I want to know what the pair to pair was because some pairs you know, it was, you know, 700 to 660. Other pairs, it was 540 to 500 getting through some of these bracket matches. And so there is a little bit of an element of luck to it. But at the same time, you're generally going to, because they seed it the way that they do, it's one versus 64, two versus 63. They kind of work it like that. And so if, you, if you're bowling well, you're going to be pulling picks against people that, you know, kind of just got through qualifying. So... Uh, but yeah, it is, it, I think it's the toughest format because U.S. Open, if you're bowling well, and we've seen Jacob Buttruff, Chris Prather, a lot of the guys that build up huge leads because you get through qualifying on the three different patterns, and then you go to uh, another cut from 36 to 24, and then you have 24 games of, of match play with with bonus pins. And this, it's not; it's three games against the person that you got against in the bracket, and you know you see how it goes. 
Yeah, and some of the matches that are the best are those matches that are in the 500s. Oh, yeah. You see guys like Tommy Jones. I saw a couple other guys this week. I've seen it many times in the Masters where this guy's getting the third third game, and they, they have no clue how to get the ball to the pocket, and they're up 30, 40, 50 pins. They just start throwing straight balls. Yeah. They just start throwing it straight down the lane so that they don't end up splitting and, and giving the other guy a chance to, to strike and catch up. So, obviously, like you said, it's just beat the other guy. That's all that matters. And uh, that's what we saw today. Of course, the biggest storyline in the end uh, was Norm Duke. May or may not be his last tournament, but at age 58, I mean, this, I think it got glossed over even on the show a little bit. They talked a little yeah. bit about it, but it, it's it's just amazing. I mean, I, I, Norm is a guy who I don't think is going to be really a big PBA 50 guy, mm, but he's yeah. 58 years old, and he just, he just ran through six guys that, uh, you know, much younger than him yeah. to take the number one seed. And uh, in the end, he didn't get it done. Anthony did get it done. A, a, a bold ball change on the right lane to an uproar. I was trying to figure out what that was originally. I, I, yeah, I didn't know if it was that or like an eternal cell or something because the eternal was about the same color scheme. And then, of course, the red oil makes it. <laughs> that, that's true. That's the trickiest part. <laughs> Mal- Maldonado's uh, white Black Widow ghost was completely <laughs> red by the time he got done with just the – you know, just the practice. Yeah. By the time he got to the show, he'd already practiced enough where that thing was just red. And All that, right. And one other show I want to throw out real quick was the uh, the How We Roll show. Did you get a chance to watch that? I, I wanted to get Tom Small went on the show, but uh, he was unavailable. Yeah, no, we, we bowl on uh, – was it Tuesday night or Wednesday night? It was Thursday night. Please. Thursday night. Okay. Well, we, we bowl on Tuesday. You we bowl have, on every night, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, we bowl on Tuesday. Then we have our breakdown pair show on Wednesday. Then we bowl on Thursday. Then we bowl on Friday. Then we have this show on Sunday. And sometimes we have tournaments on Saturday. And you have so. your own stream sometimes on Saturday. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, yeah, we, we end up doing a not show sure. on Saturday. For that. you have time. But, and I'm not that – I really didn't want to be that guy. But some of the stuff on there, I'll, I'll throw it out. I I, I hate to be negative about it because it's great for bowling. I, I just wish there were some technical or consultants on there that would say, hey, this doesn't quite go right. And I don't mean little stuff. There was some big stuff on there. And, and I, I'm, I don't want to say much about it because I, I love I love what they're doing. And it's great for Tom and it's great for bowling to get it on there. So hopefully hopefully it stays on the air. That's the first thing. they got to make it a few weeks. I, actually, Jeff Riggles posted that. It was the second highest. Oh yeah, it got a lot of viewers. Viewer viewership of, of a new show uh, that was on CBS. So that is a good sign to start the first week, and uh, we look forward to watching that next week. And hopefully, maybe get Tom on the show next week. I know he yeah he's unavailable, traveling from the Masters, of course. Once again, uh, that happens a lot. So yeah, and Tom's one of those good guys. I got to uh, I was at 2017 2018 when they had the U.S. Open in Wichita. I went down there and spent the week. Uh, Tom Smallwood is a very, very down-to-earth, cool guy that will just sit there and talk to you forever. And he hasn't been changed at all by any of the, the, the success or the uh, the attention or, or whatever else. He is a very, very down-to-earth, talk-to-anybody individual. It was it was pretty cool to get to talk to him and hang out with him. We went and ate supper and with a group of them, and it was pretty cool. He's a good guy. He's a doppelganger from my old radio partner, James Poister. got a chance yeah. to interview him in, in Indianapolis. And, you know, that, that that might be still on the old Boulder Show page, or actually it's the same page, but mm-hmm. that's up there somewhere. If you want to get on there and go back into the video section, uh, James looks just like Tom Small. <laughs> I, I thought he would be great for the part. I don't think he put yeah. in for the part. He hasn't done too much acting, although he's on IMDb in a couple of spots that may or may not be legit. But uh, anyway, it's good to see. It's good for bowling, so we'll just leave yeah. it at that. So, All right. That was a fast 20 minutes. Let's go ahead and, yeah, uh, <laughs> instead of you and I talking, let's, uh, let's do what the show concentrates on here, and let's bring in our first guest. Uh, he is the creator of the 2022 OC-Las Vegas, uh, with parentheses, Keith D., uh, the Facebook group that does everything that you could ever imagine for the bowlers in Las Vegas. So his name is Keith Dumpy. Keith, welcome back to the Bowler Show, sir. It's a pleasure to be back. Thanks, Wiles, and thanks, Luke, for having me back on. I'm so happy you guys resurrected this show. You had me on the radio show, I think, three times, and uh, that was a trip for a deaf guy, you know, being on the radio, so it's pretty cool. Now I'm on live stream, so it's even better. Well, make sure all your batteries are charged and you're ready to go, because we're going to fire off some questions for you, okay? All righty, shoot. 
All right. There's the first and foremost. How, how in the world did you just say, hey, I'm going to just spend unimaginable hour, hours of my life following the OC and helping me out starting this page? Well, in retrospect, I, I wonder why, but sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's not. Um, but vast majority, it's fun. But I just love bowling. And I was raised by a country mom, southern mom from North Carolina. And I was taught, you know, to help people, um, you know, be a caring type person. And frankly, be honest, I got embarrassed the first time I went out to the OC. I walked into the squad room with a muscle shirt on and shorts and tennis shoes. And I had to change of clothes, you know, shirt my jersey on a hanger, my black slacks. But they told me, you know, I had to go dress. And I thought I could do it in the bathroom in there. So there was things like that, things like I showed up with two two ball shoulder totes. I didn't know the casinos were that big, man. I hadn't been to Vegas in years. So uh, I learned that lesson, and I just thought, you know, once I, the true story is there was a chat board on oldbowl.com, and they did away with it. A lot of people loved it. And so, right when they did away with it, there's a guy named Mike Ward of, I guess you call it Humble or Humble, Texas. And he started a Facebook group. And he had a couple of people who were admins with him. And um, it was just basically being the same as a chat board and the way they were using it. And so, I got on there, I found out about it. And so, I started commenting on some things on it. And that was 2010. Um, and so he asked me if I would be admin the next year. And he dropped his other admins, which I think were family members. And so just he and I did it together uh, the next year. And when he said he didn't have the time, I think he had a knee injury. And he didn't have the time. So... He said, you know, if you want to take it over yourself, and I said, yeah, and I've been doing it by myself ever since. And I like having soul control naturally. Uh, it's something I can put my own personal stamp on. And, you know, it seems like people like what I do or what I try to do because I'm just Joe Bowler. I'm not an elite bowler. And I kind of know what the Joe Bowler wants for an experience. Uh, because I'm a lot like that. So I try to help people save money, try to help them plan out their trips, try to know what to do when you get there, especially if it's your first time. Um, over the years, other people have kind of jumped in. So when somebody asks a question, they have experience with the, you know, what the answer is. So they share that knowledge. So we kind of help each other out. And I try to keep that negativity to a minimum. We don't need that in bowling. There's enough of that in the world. Yeah, it's a good idea to wipe, wipe those knuckleheads off your page. I, I know you monitor and keep track of uh, some of the guys that are posting stuff they shouldn't, and you take care of it right away. Uh, what, what do you think are your most popular posts? Is it, is it more uh, about people following the scores, or is it some of the specials that you throw on the page? I think they like when I let them know, you know, when notables are bowling. Um, there used to be a notables list was published by USBC, and so, you know, I would just reiterate who was bowling that day, and they kind of quit doing that. Now they have what they call stars of the day, and so it's usually propagated either the night before the next day's team squad or the next day's squad or the morning of. And so I look at that. Sometimes it's a day before. Uh, they've done that a couple of times, like Matt McNeil's. They, it was up two days before he bowled. So I try to let people know where who's bowling that they might want to go watch if they're out there or if they just want to follow the scores along because we don't have the live streaming and that's the next best thing you know be able to follow the scores see when they're getting making runs and how they might mess up or how they come through in the end and then if they come through in the end USBC has a highlight video so I add that to it and it kind of all kind of falls together you know 
Yeah, and if, if you're having any problems with a place to change or, or to store your two-ball totes, just go to Matt Canizaro's office, and he'll be glad to uh, allow you back there. I, I've used it once before. I'm kidding because Matt's uh, Matt really doesn't like that, but he let me do it one year. So, and Matt's going to follow you here, so any, anything we say can and be can and will be held against us. So, um, when, when you find these specials, you know, the Coronado Cafe or the Casino Royales, are you actively looking for those? Do people send you that, or do you just find that stuff out uh, through the Internet? Well, uh, you, you probably noticed, but, you know, there's a lot of different places where, you know, I find my info. You know probably how Facebook algorithms work. And so when you click on a link or you look at a news story or something, it's kind of tied to your browsing. And so a lot of times stuff comes up on my news feeds, but I also love YouTube. And there's a couple of like vloggers, uh, Norma Jelly channel, and she does videos on uh, you know, the best places for brunch, the best steak places, the best barbecue, the best happy hours. So I go look at her channel frequently. Uh, honestly, I haven't subscribed to channels because I can't remember my YouTube password. <laughs> so I haven't subscribed to any of those channels. I just go check them out. Um, but uh, there's another one called uh, Travel Ruby, and she has some pretty good ones too. And there's a couple others associated with Norma Jelly that are friends, and they go and do a lot of restaurants uh, and, and things like that. So I try to like watch those. Um, I research stuff uh, like in their magazines, Las Vegas Magazine, um, in their uh, travel guide, vacation planner. Uh, which I have posted. Um, I, I scour those, look at some ads, but a lot of times if I recommend something and post it, I look at Google reviews first because I don't just share stuff if, you know, they got a three point something review, you know, rating on it. So I, I try to share stuff, uh, looking and see what other people thought and had good experiences. So, because I want the bowlers, you know, to go out there and have a good time. So. Good to, to meet you in person last year and uh, watch you bowl a little bit. Uh, when, when are you heading out this year? Yeah, I saw you back there laughing. <laughs> I never would do that to the, to the bowl. <laughs> I haven't bowled very good out there, like, pretty much the whole time. I had a couple of 200 gains the first couple years, and I uh, tore my bicep tendon in 2010 Reno, and I came back and was asked to sub on Summer League, and two weeks later, uh, I snapped it completely. So I haven't been the same bowler since then. And uh, my main problem when I go out there is I don't sleep. So, and I run around too much before I bowl and then by the time I get to the time of bowl I'm tired and I'm a little bit older so I fall off the shot and don't roll it so that's why my scores are lower but um, I'll be going uh, in two and a half weeks I get in town uh, April 20th and I bowl uh, Friday April 21st the 2 p.m. squad and doubles and singles Saturday uh, the 22nd at 10.30 and then um, on Sunday, I'm changing hotels. I'm staying at South Point uh, the first four nights, comp. And then uh, I'm changing over to Orleans, and I got four nights comp there. And I'm going to see some friends that are there at the USBC convention. All right. You talked a little bit about it, but let's, let's dive into it even more. When you talk about doing a lot of run around out there in Vegas, where, where are some of your favorite places to go? Well, uh, I play my Vegas online slots, and so um, you don't have to spend any money on it. And I've been playing it for five years, and I haven't spent a penny. And you can build up rewards credits, and they have a different variations of the game, so you can build up credits faster if you play two or three different games. And so with that, I've gone to Mandalay Bay, Shark Reef Aquarium twice, um, Siegfried and Roy's uh, Secret Gardens, Lion, Tiger, Dolphin Habitat twice, uh, Bodies Exhibit, and Titanic Exhibit at Luxor. 
Um, I saw Ka show uh, Cirque de Soleil at, I think that was uh, MGM Grand. I saw a Topless Showgirl review at New York, New York. Um, I did go kart racing. That was a lot of fun. Need to speak. Um, and this year I got four shows lined up. I got America's Got Talent at Luxor, and I have uh, Fantasy Showgirls at Luxor on Sunday. Monday I got Tournament of Kings dinner show, um, the medieval uh, show. Uh, you get a big Cornish game hen and put red potatoes and uh, corn, and you got to eat it with your hands, no utensils. So it'll be fun. And then uh, Tuesday, I have a show at Rio. It's called Wow the Vegas Spectacular. And so those were uh, Tournament of Kings was free, comped um, through that game. The others were BOGOs. Um, so I got friends going with me to that split cost and uh, but then I'm going to try and see they have that new show uh, a ride called uh, Fly Over Vegas it's a fashion show mall um, they have like two experiences like going through it's like a 3D ride uh, theater like going through like American Southwest there's one of them the other one's Iceland and then you can buy a package where you can get ride both of them and have a drink afterwards so I'm planning on doing that and then they have um, another uh, thing there it's called Arcadia Earth and it's like an immersion room experience um, it's got different theme rooms that are pretty cool. If you look it up, it's a pretty cool place to go. And if I got any time left, I want to go to Area 15. Um, that's the place where they got, you know, 3D interactive games, immersion experience, that crazy grocery store with weird products and hidden doors to hidden rooms and speakeasies and stuff. It's like really cool. And then they got another one, if I have time, it's called Rail Explorer. Uh, it's like a, a pedal push railroad car. Uh, you go about four and a half miles on it and it's self-propelled and it's a part of it's uphill so um but then they stop and they um you have like a little lunch you know and they have drinks for you, you have to bring your own lunch and then they take you back on a bus and then they have like a whole rail museum uh, so uh, i might try and fit that in but i have videos of that like uh, on my group most people think, you know, when they have Facebook group, it's just a chat board, and there's tabs like underneath the uh, the banner, you know, image, and one of them's files, and under the files, I got a ton of stuff, files set up for dining, things to do besides bowling, um, happy hours like crap beer, cold drinks, uh, places to go for happy hour specials. I have links for that. I have videos in the comments. Um, I have also in there, let's see, I got hotel info, entertainment calendars, bowling videos and archives from last year and the highlight videos from this year so far. Uh, shuttles and ground transportation, visitor's guide and info, casinos and gaming. I have a comparison data chart from past years that shows top 100, 150 places, what scores it took uh, in each division. I have uh, a golf file where you can find golf specials if you like to play golf. You know a lot of bowlers like to play golf. We have a historical load of cash, highs and lows. Um, and then I have like tournament news where I link your show, um, USBC's tournament news page, uh, Tim Berg's above180.com, uh, Jeff Riggle's uh, 11frame.com blog, and I also have photo albums for like South Point. Uh, it has you know the floor maps. It has. Menus, happy hour specials at the different restaurants. I have photo albums for 
the side events, uh, Bowler's Journal Championship uh, brackets. They had the bracket forms and the brochure. Um, several years in a row, Tom Hess would contact me and say, hey, you know what Max N is. <laughs> and so uh, I, I ended up getting the bracket forms and I would post them so, you know, people like to plan out how much money they're going to take the heavy hitters, you know, when they go out there and get in brackets. So um, I have that. I have a photo album for the BTN that Rick Ramsey's running over at Gold Coast. I have um, lane play and arsenal and coaching uh, file. And it has links to Mike Jasnow's coaching and uh, Coach Bill Hall's Specto sessions. And I have a photo album for OC Forms Rules and Frequently Asked Questions. I have a photo album for the transit bus maps. And also, I added to that today, there's a set price. And if you take a taxi from the airport, to different zones on the strip so don't let them like you know screw you around so to speak you know it's set price and it's, they're supposed to charge that nothing more so that's on there if you're if you're staying on along the strip all right Keith. sounds like you really have not a whole lot of information on your page so yeah, yeah. <laughs> so. i try yeah. <laughs> That was uh, that was quite a bit. Uh, before we let you go, uh, Luke's got a couple of questions he wants to ask. Uh, okay. so we were talking, yeah, we were talking before the show a little bit. There's some extra stuff that you do, uh, or that you support or provide uh, funds for that you try to raise money for through your group. So talk a little bit about uh, what you do for the group this year and where you're going to go uh, with the group next year. Yeah, what I did is, um, you know, in my group, and one thing I want to highlight real quick, and this goes along with that, um, Facebook constantly changes formats and what they call stuff. And it used to be called pin post, then they called it announcements, now it's called featured post. And if you click that on the top, I make sure the first one this year is quick links. So live scoring is the first one. That's what people want to see the most, you know. And then there's like individual results, um, uh, leaderboards, uh, stars of the day, um, green sheet, liability waiver. Um, all that type stuff is in quick links in the first one. But further in there, I put one back, I believe, September or sometime last year asking for donations. And I hadn't planned the way it was going to go until after... It was January, and I received 13, and I got 4,800 people on my group, so that was disheartening, and I, sometimes I'm not the most diplomatic in the way that I speak. Uh, I've been known to, they tell me I have no filter, but you know how I feel about stuff, but anyways, that kind of hit me a little bit funny, you know, because I do put a lot of my time in this. People don't realize how much, you know, and so I said, well, I decided to go forward to the 2023 Reno group, and Reno's changed so much since we've been since 2016. You know, the stadium's been uh, refurbished, downtowns, I tore down a lot of those, you know, low-end hotels and built condos and apartments and uh, other nice things down there. So um, there's a lot new there, and so... I said, you know, for you to go forward, you got to send a donation because the only way I have to thank people that do send something is to split them. You know, where if you do send something, then, hey, you get on my next year's group, and this is a one time thing. I'm never going to ask for any more money, you know, as long as I do it. And the money's not for me. What I did with the money that was left over from this jersey that, uh, they surprised me with several years ago, David Witten out Colorado solicited some people behind the scenes and they got me this nice jersey, US o BC Open Championships with my name on it, Facebook logo and USBC logo on the sleeves. Well, with that leftover money, I uh, only got like $320 total and jersey was 85 with shipping 
and so I donated 220 to my local for youth memberships. Um, I didn't take any of the money for myself. And so the money that I've gotten so far this year, I'm up to 60 people have donated. Um, and I have about $1,700 right now. And our USBC uh, local, they charge the kids $4 for USBC and $13 for the local for a total of 17 and that goes towards prizes and awards at the end of the year, patches during the year, and stuff that USBC doesn't provide. So it's $17 a kid, and they have 50 kids this year, and I'm trying to entice them that I'm going to have them make an announcement at the end of their, their season, which comes up in a couple weeks, and say, to entice you all to come back, I'm paying your membership for next year, $17 for those 50 kids, plus... Bring some more kids with you, some friends to help build it up. I'll pay their membership too. And then with the money I have left over of that, they'll just pitch in for some extra prizes or trophies, nicer trophies or something. But if I get a lot of the people on the group by the end of the year, they're going to be surprised probably when they say, when are you going to start the 2023 Reno group? It's already started, man. I already got about 100 people on there right now. So it's people that donated this time and people that donated for the jersey before. It's a thank you. It's people like you all that have me on a show that, you know, warms my heart to be able to do something like this. It's a thank you to you two. And it's a thank you to my teammates that help me win money when I bowl like crap. People that have given me rides and friends or bought me dinner or drinks when I've gone out. So I've not set any amount for this. To be honest, I've gotten between five and a hundred dollars. Five's been the low, a hundred dollars been the top and out of sixty people. So and if I get a lot of money, you know, out of that four thousand, if they really want to come forward and they'll be on my groups forever after that as long as I keep doing them. If I get a lot of money, then I'm looking at youth scholarships. So. All right, Keith, uh, I'm getting some angry texts from Matt Canizaro wondering why his time is getting cut off. So we better let you go. I want to thank you very much for coming on and, and going through all the stuff that you've got. And uh, you keep doing what you're doing, and uh, things will work out. We'll keep seeing you on the page. Uh, real quick, before you go, tell, tell the, the people where they can find you on Facebook once again. Uh, it's Facebook. It's uh, 2022. OC dash Las Vegas and then in parentheses Keith and last name D like uh, initial D and tell Matt I said hi he's been very helpful to me when I've had a question uh, back and forth um, I really appreciate you know uh, the relationship we built up we kind of butted heads a little bit early on you know when I started this group uh, but uh, it's come, come to be like a really nice working relationship between him and others at USBC, you know, that I really appreciate when I have a question and I want a direct source answer. I don't deal in speculation and fake rumor mill stuff on my site. I want exact answers, you know, when somebody asks a question. So they help me with that if I can't find it myself. And also say hi to Bob Learn Jr. like later on. I've got to bowl with him a couple times at in the PBA 50 at the Villages and he's always smiles, shakes my hand. Just a pleasure to bowl with. All right, Keith. Uh, Matt could hear those words, so we'll, we'll bring him in and we'll talk about that. But once again, uh, we need to let you go. We appreciate you coming on the Bowler Show. All right, guys. Thanks. And thanks for having me. All right, man. Have a great night. All right. And we kid because we care on the show. Matt has not <laughs> yeah. been sending us any types of angry texts that I know of. Here, let me double check my phone. It looks like yeah, that. yeah. Matt, uh, Matt just sent me something. He's uh, he's just finishing up with something and trying to get everything set up. So he'll be with us here in a couple minutes once he gets everything set up. So. Okay, well, maybe he didn't hear those kind of words. We can convey those to him when he comes yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. And uh, kind of like uh, everything <laughs> else in the bowling world, Luke, not a lot of really going on at the OC this week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely nothing. I don't know what Matt's going to talk about. Yeah, he'll figure out something. He'll drone on about my hot dog eating, or it's not in the queue yet, right? No, no. He'll I'm drone sure on about yeah, my hot dog eating.
dog comment still, I'm sure, <laughs> the magic hot dogs out there. At, yeah, I'm happy to bunch of them. On Keith's page, Foot Long Hot Dogs, two forty nine, the Casino Royale. If you have had your fill of the South Point dollar dollar and a quarter and dollar seventy five, depending on where you get them there. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like I big, put the uh, yeah, I put I put the group name in the the chat there if you want to check that out. But all you have to do is get on Facebook. Uh, search that group. Once you find it, they've got a couple questions. They want to know your USB-C number so that you, they can verify that. And then they, they want to know if you're going to, if you bowl the tournament, number one. But he's got all kinds of information on there about all <laughs> kinds of things. It's not just tournament-specific stuff. It's about uh, venue, all kinds of other. Like he said, he puts, uh, if Southwest or something has any kind of delays or something. Bus, it's all, bus routes. Yeah, yeah. It's all kinds of stuff that you don't even think about until you're there. And it's like, oh, crap, I wish I knew this. He's got everything that you can think about that's on there for information so it's a great group to check out once again he's got the uh you know he does take he does take the donations and he does um yeah he does he does you know pay that forward to whatever he's going to do and so that's that's the thing is that there's a lot of people that are on that page um but uh going forward you know, chip in a little bit, help him out and he'll put you in the group for next year and so that you can get all this great great information so yeah, I need to uh, get on that myself, uh, and I never knew half the stuff he just talked about in in the uh, in the interview was on that page. I had no idea. I knew he had a lot of stuff. And yeah, it's wild. I didn't the know about all the files. On there. I've never dug into that stuff. I really need to mm-hmm. because it's really helpful. And uh, as you could hear, he uh, when he goes to Vegas, he doesn't just uh, head to the room and you know at night sleep. Oh and, uh, no, no, do nothing he's... other than bowling. He's doing all kinds of different things. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a little risque for the show, but that's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, not really because we're on we're on YouTube. We can pretty much do and pretty yeah. much say everything. Is that uh, I think so? As long as we to? don't get reported, so just don't get reported. Just don't report us, and we'll we'll keep talking the good stuff. Right? Yeah. Now I'm sure Matt is uh, working on something right now. Something might be happening in the team event, so you and I might yeah. want to might want to plan Matt. on him possibly not showing up here so you and I uh he he said he's going to get set set up here real quick but uh, we do have um we do have options here okay well let's so. actually let's do this let's take a moment and uh let's uh, check in on bobbyjacksons.com here and see what's see what Bob Foster's got going on Jackson's Trading is the place to sell all your unwanted precious metals, including broken gold and silver jewelry. They also buy old silver and gold coins, so check them out for all your buying and selling needs. Also, did you know that Bobby Jackson's Trading pays top dollar for your unwanted gift cards? You know the ones your grandma got you for Christmas? Bobby Jackson's Trading is located on 23rd Street, just one block east of Nolan Road in Independence, Missouri. They're open seven days a week. Check them out at bobbyjacksons.com or give Bob Foster a call at 816-463-1919. That's 816-463-1919. That's interesting. All right, back to the Bowler Show. And Bob Foster again. Uh, once again, a, a big fan of the show. Bob runs probably one of the better... Summer leagues. I don't know if you know about it. Even it's on Thursday nights. Uh, it's called Bracket Madness. He also runs it during the summer. Oh, that's a whole bunch. Yeah, that, I like Wednesday. that idea. He's got a, he's got a great format. Top twelve move on uh, each week after three games, and you bowl all year. You don't bowl with the team. You're bowling by yourself or for yourself. Even though, let's say, hey, I want to bowl with Luke and Angel every week. That'll be who you bowl with. Yeah. But then you're not really bowling against each other. You're bowling singles against somebody else. And then uh, you move on from there. So he's got a really good format. It's it's fun in the summer where they they go down to match play. And then uh, if if you want to check that out, I just saw he had fifty nine people that he knows of that have signed up. Yeah. Uh, for the Thursday night league, and uh, it's just it's just crazy over the summer. It's it's a very popular league. You'll fill up Lunar Bowl. So if you want to bowl that, check Bob Foster. Uh, you can also uh, bowl our Kansas City tournaments. I know yeah. we've got a. Uh, had a little mini break here. We're going to have a tournament Saturday at Summit Lanes at 1 o'clock, just a regular tour of KC Six Gamer, the top four step ladder. And then, as we do every year, we in- invade Royal Crest Lanes. Yeah. Uh, Larry Burton and Jesse Bauer and who's that other guy? Uh, Rusty Burton, is that is the other the other Burton? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like Rusty and then his, uh, his twins that, that help out at the center there that are twice as tall as he is. <laughs> We we kid Rusty because they they do a great job out there. I've always kidded them if they would move that bowling alley 
Oh my god, yeah, they do such City. a great because we we actually oh drive out there a couple times a week to to bowl, and that's where I do all my review videos at too. Is Royal Crest and Lawrence? It's a thirty minute drive, thirty five minute drive, but they do such a good job, and the the, the Larry's there all the time, and Jesse's there all the time, and. Uh, they've got a great group. They got a great staff that you know you walk in there year after year and see the same people, and they're you know it, it's just a really cool place to be. So we're okay. going to see if uh, anybody can beat Trevor and Packy this year. <laughs> uh, go there, go there today, and ask for Tamario. Always, yeah, yeah, I always like to use that one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, Tamario's there all the time, Tamar- and then Tamar- uh, go, is, go that, see that the, is a person's name just for people wondering what we're talking about. Yeah, go see the uh, also go see the the bar manager there, the Midwest Monster Keith Williams, two <laughs> X Super Bowl champion who is uh, also into professional bodybuilding. His wow. wife Tina is also into professional bodybuilding. Yeah, is that who we see? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Tina. Oh, yeah, boy. Tina is the one that's in the bar there all the time. Do that's not mess uh, with Tina. Yeah, yeah. She she's her own bouncer. No, do not mess with uh, <laughs> any anybody there. Rusty or Burton. Well, we'll just say he's a uh, insecurity on. The yeah, he's so. he's in security, but there's a bouncer. So Kansas City tournaments will be there. Uh, a little little different this year, or not this year, but a little different from other tournaments. Uh, the doubles is going to be on Saturday. The singles on mm-hmm. Sunday for obvious reasons. Hard to get a partner necessarily on Easter. Yeah. So we've always done it that way. And this year, actually, we're going to start at 10 a.m. both days. I'm not sure that you even knew that for sure. Yeah, I think we were kind of we were kind of expecting that anyway. So no. we got a, we got a bunch of people that are coming in from all over the place to to bowl those. So so we'll uh, we'll give them a shout out. They do do a great job out there, and we always kind of you know we talk about we talk about how some of the places just it's just a little too far. Lawrence is just a little too far. But yeah. Anyway, speaking of guys who. Uh, haven't are a little far away. We're gonna check in with Matt right now before we run out of time. Uh, this is Canazaro's corner each and every week. Actually, gonna move to seven twenty next week. Matt, uh, you got some exciting things going on there right now. What uh, what was with the delay? Uh, time zone mostly. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> no idea. We're uh, you know, we're uh, we're here in Vegas, obviously Pacific time. Working with Aaron, who's in Central time, and talking in East Coast time in our AP yeah. style. So. Uh, and then we're throwing around numbers 520, 620, 720 next week. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, whatever. Here, here we are. We made it. We made it as you always do. Actually, as I said, we're gonna we're gonna give you an experience here, and I'm gonna kind of like you did with me with the writing part last year. Uh, we're gonna throw Luke to the wolves, and uh, I, I don't know. Before I send it over to Luke, uh, Keith had some kind words for you also uh, for some help that you've done for him. I know you weren't able to hear it because. You had to go do what you were doing, but I wanted to convey those to you since you weren't able to hear them. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate all, all that Keith does, of course, to uh, to keep our bowlers informed and in a different way than we do. I think uh, between us, uh, we kind of give them the whole package, right? We report on what's happening here, and, and he helps you uh, get the most of your experience off the lanes and, and even on the lanes, keeping in touch. So uh, certainly we appreciate that and the kind words. Yeah, so – uh, this is going to be pretty easy for me. I don't. Uh, there was a, there's a few things that have happened there this week, and I think we've been kind of fortunate for uh, for the show purposes that uh, there's been a lot of action already so far at the Open Championship. So uh, tell us what happened this week. Uh, just looking at the at the newsreel here on Bull.com, uh, of course, uh, when Matty McConnor score comes to town, it's been a minute since he's been in the spotlight. Uh, it's been a rebuilding process for Mr. McNeil. Uh, but he's got a great group in place right now, and, and they certainly showed it, uh, making it run at some some record numbers uh, for sure. We don't have a lot of 3,500s in the history of this event, and they got awfully close. 3,486 was the number, and, of course, uh, he came out and uh, opened in the first frame, got, took care of all the jackpots, the 159, the 30 clean, took all the pressure off there, uh, and then he rattled off 11 in a row. Uh, so to uh, retain the, the nickname, of course, uh, and then went on to lead the team into the lead. And uh, I really thought we were going to see uh, potentially a record team all event. And I say that because uh, they bowled on the same squad with Nick Heilman and Nicholas J's pro shop. And those guys had 30, 42. So a little bit off the pace of McNeil's team on the other side of the house, uh, but they came in yesterday and they were nearly 900 over for doubles and singles. Unbelievable. Uh, enough to get their picture taken and get talked about a little bit. I actually just had a quick chat with Nick. Uh, that was a phenomenal performance. Plus 42 after team event, knowing you have to get to almost 10,000 to get team all events, and they almost got there. They got to 
98-88. So within 30 pins of the lead. And they had a, a deficit of 330 pins going in. And I thought if those guys were able to do that, if McNeil's group were able to put something together, uh, we could have seen a monster number. And unfortunately, uh, they came up a little bit short, got uh, got out of the gate slowly and ended up just behind Nicholas Jays. But, man, uh, the numbers are out there. I think that uh, Andy Mills and the crew will tell you that uh, about the team event. And then, of course, McNeil and those guys – would be able to tell you the same about doubles and singles. Uh, that one group that puts it together, uh, we're looking at uh, as something big potentially. Yeah, that's just to put into perspective once again for everybody watching. Uh, ten thousand is kind of the number for team all events. That I mean, if you shoot ten thousand, you're you're probably going to win. Uh, but that's two thousand per bowler, and two thousand is a little bit over a two twenty average. And if you can, if anybody watching can think, when have you ever even gotten close to two thousand <laughs> at nationals, averaging two twenty two, two twenty two twenty three, whatever the numbers work out to? Um, but just just to even have a concept of those kind of numbers. And that's not just you shooting 2000. Everybody else on the team has to shoot 2000 or average 220 plus for the entire event, all nine games. That's, that's really getting some serious work done. Well, and, and we've seen, you know, every aspect of it over the years, somebody potentially 2200 to lead the way. Somebody has to be the low guy in that whole situation. Um, it's not often to see a, a consistent performance uh, for example, like our record holders, uh, Pollard's from 1996, the longest standing record we have at this event, uh, all of those guys were around 2,100. Uh, it was a phenomenal team effort, and that's what it takes. Uh, but again, sometimes one or two guys get super hot uh, and get the job done, but still 10,000, as you said, uh, is a sizable number, even with two of the guys shooting 2,000 over 2,100 or higher. Uh, that is That is big time. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's just crazy numbers to even think about. So, um, so th this far, I mean, again, anytime Matt McNeil shoes up, I think he shot seven forty two in the team event. I don't know what he ended up for for all events, but even he says that, oh, you know, I don't I don't get a whole lot of practice anymore. I I, I try to stay as active as possible if I'm busy or whatever, and then they go out and shoot a score that's uh, that's very that's going to be. I, I don't know. Even you, you can say, okay, so this so far the scores have been fairly decent this year, but there's a difference between fairly decent and 34, 86 or whatever they shot. Um, I, that sounds like a pretty, uh, pretty safe number to me, I guess. I know we're early in the tournament, but th that's a big number. I, again, I'd, I've been here long enough to know. Uh, I thought Ronnie Vokes, in 2009, shooting 23-21 with the uh, 857, I thought we're just just give him the eagle now, I, for yeah. sure. Uh, right. And then how that transpired, that was that was the end of April, so that was a couple of months in. And uh, of course, we know Bo Gergen came through, and, and there were some other close calls. And uh, you, I, you just you never ever know. Uh, that is a fantastic number. It's fantastic in the history of the event. Uh, but uh, did they lose them out there potentially? Uh, Ron Moore just had uh, six zero, I believe, was his number. Yeah. So, uh, if that fifth guy gets hot, similar situation. Yeah. And then for McNeil, uh, he ended up at twenty fifty two with six zero four in doubles. So doubles was tough for those guys. Uh, they bowled well in singles. They got things going. Uh, everything started to develop, but doubles was a challenge. I think across the ten. Uh, and again, it's a it's a marathon, right? It's forty five games. You got to put it together for for the team all events, uh, team event. Things fall into place one magical day. Uh, certainly uh, anything is possible there. But uh, I think based on looking at the numbers, I think 3,500 is, is out there for sure. Yeah, I would I would have to say so. Uh, just just from looking at what's been out there so far, obviously we're just a few weeks into the tournament. we got plenty of time to go. I mean, uh, our groups are going the next to last days, which is July, middle of July. So we still have – we still have uh, – what is that? three and a half solid months here of, of competition left to do. And it, it's, you know, 18 hours a day for the next three and a half months there. So <laughs> there's plenty of potential for some more big scores to come in. Well, there's some great, great teams that have been put together that are still headed our way. Uh, there's teams like Nicholas Jace that before they were 
on the radar. They weren't, right? I, I saw them in the squad room in 2012, uh, and I was just trying to tell Nick this story, but they, they looked like they were ready for the event. They just had a look. They had just the way they were dressed, the swagger, whatever it was. Uh, I'd never heard of them. I don't think anybody had. They were just kids back then, right? That's 10 years ago. Yeah. Uh, and three hours later, uh, I'm rushing back to the, the River Center, uh, putting my tie on, getting ready to interview them as the new leaders. They went on to win. Um, and now, of course, everybody looks for them when they're coming out to bowl and and, and kind of wanting to model the game plan a little bit after what they're doing. So uh, is the next Nicholas Jays out there? Who knows? Is it Higgy's Aquarium with some new additions uh, and some lineup changes? Who knows? Uh, there's always the ones that you expect big things from. Uh, sometimes they deliver. Uh, often they deliver, and uh, it's not a surprise at all. Other times they might struggle, and uh, that's what this event's all about, right? It's about finding uh, the next star or seeing, uh, you know, if the, the longevity, like we saw in 2009 with the uh, Lens Limited, the, mm -hmm. the, the old guys, as they said, they got it done winning team and team all events, nearly breaking the record there. So uh, that's what makes it so much fun. You just never know uh, who's going to be on the other end of that call when it's the front seven. Yeah, that's a good point, too, is that, you know, we all think about, OK, well, uh, you know, this team's coming, this team's bowling this time. But there's plenty of teams out there. There are plenty of individuals out there that are going to be the next you know, big names for, for years to come. I know that, uh, I think Jeff Riggle said that they, they got team raisin back together now that they're all, uh, they're all past their, you prime, know, the, prime. You know, hey, past, <laughs> past their prime. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> past their Sorry, prime, Jeff. but kind of, kind of gotten out of some of the, the, uh, restrictions, requirements, whatever around, you know, PBA titles and whatever else. And, um, they're sick so, that stuff goes away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll see what they have left in the tank, but uh, and I know that they're glad to be back together again. Well, there's a lot of guys uh, and, and bowlers and ladies that, that I've met over these 18 years uh, who may be OC famous. I'll admit it. The first time Bill Lillard walked into my office, I didn't know who he was. I was embarrassed later, of course, but to know he was a, <laughs> the legend, he was the guy at the Open Championships. It was my first month at the event. I didn't know the history yet. I didn't know the faces. Uh, he walked in. I thought uh, he was lost, right? I'll tell this story all the time. And, and um, little did I know the role that he played in the tournament and what he would play uh, in my life over the decades after that. But uh, you just never know. So you can be OC famous, but not real world bowling famous. It's, it's just a thing, right? There's there's guys here who, uh, who are legendary on these lanes, but – uh, maybe they have real jobs and, and other priorities outside of these two or three days a year. Uh, and, and that's okay. Uh, and it just takes time to learn who those folks are and uh, to identify them. And, and it's a lot of fun being the one to tell the stories of their careers and the next generation of those OC famous bowlers. Yeah. That's really how Matt McNeil busted onto the scene because he just showed up one year and <laughs> shot all kinds of stuff. Then I think it was the next year he shot all kinds of stuff again, again, and then he kept doing it. And now he's now he's a household name for several different reasons. But uh, but yeah, it's a pretty cool thing. Well, I, and for me, again, to be able to follow their careers and tell those stories and see the success, I, or if not, if it's just one time, if you come off the lanes yeah. and you you have just done something that is a career accomplishment for you, the honor of being able to tell that story to share that. Uh, and then always be a part of your your tale here at the Open Championships when they announce your name for the rest of your life because you bowled 300. So what if your other two games were 167 and 161? <laughs> Nobody's going to remember that. You will always be the guy who bowled 300, and I will hopefully always be the guy who tells that story uh, and conveys it to uh, all of the fans, to your hometown media. Uh, and, you know, I, again, talking to, to Brian Nicodemus over in the, uh, in the Motive booth, he was that guy. He bowled 300 at this event. We had a conversation recently about uh, how come there wasn't a video, and we talked about that. He's got the article framed. Chipper Key has the article framed from when he took the lead and went on to win singles. Uh, and so uh, it's an honor for me to be a part of that. If there's an eagle for writing stories about people who are good at bowling, uh, hopefully I'm in contention for that someday. Yeah, and that's that's another thing is I've got a, I've got a, a friend here from town that uh, shot 837 
in singles in Knoxville in 2003, Ron Barr, still the only person in the history of the tournament mm-hmm. to shoot back-to-back 300s. That's the only thing he's ever done there. He shot 560 in team, didn't even get <laughs> in practice or anything for doubles and singles. Then he goes out there and has the back 27 that set. That's the only thing he's done. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing that he's ever done there. But still, he's still the only guy in the history of the tournament. Back-to-back 300 mm-hmm. on singles, Knoxville 2003, and that's really a uh, – you know, that's just he took that opportunity and made it uh, made it work for him that year. But but yeah, that's, that's kind of a, still kind of a cool thing, even if you've only done it one time. That's that's sometimes all it takes. Well, I, as two years before my arrival, but to have been able to tell that story and share it and, and get it out there in the, in the world, and uh, I imagine it, it got some traction. All right, that is a big deal. The tournament, the hundredth anniversary, first time something's ever happened. The only time since. Uh, and now one of three guys will have two in the same year, let yeah. alone back to back. So, um, and that's always going to be a trivia question, no matter what, he'll always be the first. Mm-hmm. You never know. Uh, but, uh, again, Ron Barr, OC famous for sure. Uh, he's in, he's in the record book. He's in the media kit, uh, and he's in a lot of conversations. And every time he comes out, we get to see him. Uh, it's nice to revisit that moment and hear those announcements and see his reaction to hearing his name announced, uh, mm-hmm. as, the 300s, the 800, and of course, as the singles champion. Yeah, and Bill always brings uh, his wife out, to his beautiful bride, as he likes to say. Uh, Matt, in your defense, uh, not knowing Bill Lillard earlier, uh, you've been there so long that when Bill first started, uh, his all all event or his uh, all time total pins were actually uh, calculated in <laughs> Roman numerals. So that's how long you've been there. I believe it was MCXLVI was where he was that's- stood. Uh, back nice. then, and now he's at, uh, I don't know, 120. What, where's he at? What's his exact total? Do you, do you have that on your own? Uh, 124,087 was the number. Uh, and uh, we certainly miss Bill, and, and uh, we get to see his family come out uh, every year. We just saw Syl Thiel's family as well. Uh, so the relationships that we built uh, because of those moments. Syl Thiel's another guy, right? He never did anything uh, super noteworthy on the lanes, didn't have an honor score, didn't win a title. Uh, but he dedicated his life to the sport and the event, bowled 71 years. Now he's tied for the participation record uh, and a huge part uh, of what we do and why we do it uh, and a phenomenal opportunity to see them uh, every year and, and a relationship that we now have uh, because of this event, because of bowling, uh, and without any honor scores or titles involved. All right, well. Be, be around in 2085 when I get to 120,000. That's a, I just did some quick math in my head, and at 1,700 a, a year, and we'll be generous with that. Uh, that's about what I got. <laughs> Man, I know you're busy. Uh, enough about Hilly and Millie and, and Maddie McGonner score. We'll let you get back uh, to work and doing what you do out there. And once again, thanks for everything you're doing. And uh, it's, it's playtime is over. It's time to go back to work now. I appreciate it, guys. we got a squad uh, about to hit the lane, so look forward to seeing what they have in store for us. Uh, keep an eye on the official OC Facebook page. Yesterday, super busy, a lot of good news, very diverse news as well across all the divisions and, and all the things. So uh, looking forward to that, and I appreciate you guys, and uh, let's do this again soon. All right, hopefully we will be. We'll, we will see. All right, Matt, have a good night. Take care, sir. You as well. All right, Matt Canizaro, Media Relations Manager at the USBC Open Championships, and obviously not just the Open Championships. He's there all, all year yeah, at the uh, USBC working, doing uh, some other good things. But uh, we've, got, uh, we've been running a little long today, Matt. Yeah, uh, a little bit. Yeah. We, we, better, uh, we better move this along. So let's go ahead and bring in our next guest uh, without further ado. Uh, you guys know him as Chuck on the truck. He's been working in the bowling world for a long time. Got a couple of, of neat things going on with the Brunswick Youth Experience and Bowl for Life. His name is Chuck Gardner. Chuck, welcome back to the Bowler, Bowler Show. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you having me. Absolutely. Now, I, I had you on a couple times before, right? Before uh, in the in the old days, like in 2015. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had I had hey, less gray, I had less gray hair then. Well, you might have had less gray hair, but let's just put it this way. I weigh the same as I weighed in 2015, and I I know you don't. You've done a great job here uh, recently. How, how much weight have you lost overall? Um, I, I lost I lost 70 pounds, but I've put a few back on. So uh, we don't. Count um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You got get get a little lazy. Um, I got to get back to work. I've probably put on I don't know 10 or 15 back on. I just you know I don't know just 
life. <laughs> life gets in the way sometimes and lost some focus and uh, I need to get back after it. My wife's, my wife's been on my case a little bit. So I, I can relate. My wife's probably watching right now, so she, uh, <laughs> she can relate to that. So, all right, Chuck, you were on the, uh, you were known as Chuck on the truck for a lot, lot of years. Uh, you've got some other exciting stuff going on right now. Take, take a moment. And let's, uh, let's tackle those right up, right off. Well, yeah, I, you know, 20 years, uh, I've been, uh, working the PBA tour. Um, and obviously the last six years with the ladies tour and, and the PBA 50 tour. So, um, you know, 20 years is a long time. So, uh, I was given some thought, um, to retiring going into this year and, you know, just slowing down a little bit and, and, uh, doing a few things that, uh, you know, spend time with the grandchildren and things like that. Um, so I went and talked to Brunswick and, they basically asked me, what would you like to do? And I said, I, you know, if I'm going to stay around and you guys would like me to stay around and they said they would, I uh, said, so I'd like to do something with youth. So uh, they basically handed me the keys to a vehicle that didn't run yet. So my job was to figure out how to make it run. And so we came up with this idea, the Brunswick Youth Experience. And, and what we're doing basically is supporting youth tournaments all around the country. Uh, mostly ones that uh, that the Brunswick brands uh, sponsor. Um, although we're we're doing one this coming weekend in Rochester, where Brunswick doesn't sponsor the event, um, but they are helpful at the event. So we go and uh, whatever the tournament director would like to do, uh, we figure out a way to make it happen for them. If they want to, if they want to have a little clinic, if they want to have just. Uh, some on lane time. Uh, last week I was in uh, in LA, had a great time at JAT down there, and, and um, it was really uh, Yamo does a great job. He's been doing it for 30 years, and everybody that's anybody that's ever been a decent bowler in Southern California bowled JAT. So um, he wanted to do a clinic on Saturday. So Bill O'Neill and I um, went out, we did a clinic on Saturday did like an hour in the classroom, an hour and a half on the lanes. And then they did a little no tap tournament for the kids. And then on Sunday, uh, they did an adult youth tournament and then the tournament was full and, uh, our class was full. Uh, we, we had a hundred and change, uh, people in the class and it was, uh, it was a blast. We had a great time. The week before that I was in Michigan and, and we did a, a half an hour in the MGMA, uh, event. We did a half hour, classroom presentation uh, with I was there with Dasha and then we just uh, went around the bowling center and meeting kids and meeting families and and uh, signing pictures and just spending time with the families and spending time with the kids and so the 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 belief that we have and is that we just as an industry need to do a better job supporting um, youth events and uh Storm does an unbelievable job with SYCs, um, but none of us have really ever focused on the kids that that may or you know may be our lifelong bowlers that that uh, you know that don't that aren't as good as the kids that bowl SYCs and compete and do so well in SYCs. So I think we've we've missed those kids uh, for a couple of generations, in my opinion, and I think we've missed them. So so that's my new gig. Um, I love it. It's it's. I'm having so much fun doing it. Um, going to the events, spending time with the families. The uh, um, I've created so many relationships all, over all my years in bowling, but having uh, new chances to uh, have relationships with kids and their parents, and and just you know taking pictures and just spending time. And so there's real people ask me all the time. Tell me what your event is about. And I'm like, yeah, it's it's evolving. And, and my idea is that if a tournament director reaches out to me and we make arrangements to be at one of their events, what do you want to accomplish? Like, how can I help you? How can I help your event? I don't want to be closed minded. I don't want to have this, you know, preconceived idea of this is what works. And this is, this is what makes the event better. Um, I just want to go and spend time with the kids and, and enjoy it. And, uh, and that's what we're doing. 
Um, I'm, I'm the next two weekends. I'm, I'm, I'm in Rod, uh, Rochester, New York this weekend. Next week I'm in, in uh, uh, mm, outside of Chicago, rock something where, where, uh, Rockport, rock, Rockford, 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 Rockford for, for an AYT Rockford. event. So I'll be there with, uh, with Edward and his group at AYT. And uh, so we've, you know, just doing something nearly every weekend, and uh, and it's a lot of fun. All right. Well, how can uh, how can the parents find you? How can they sign up? Uh, all they need to do is uh, follow the Brun the uh, Brunswick Youth Experience page. Uh, we have a uh, Instagram page. We have a Facebook page. Uh, just check it out. Just go on there. Um, we've only had the page for I don't know, maybe two weeks now. But we're already up to I think two thousand followers, and we're, we're growing it. It's getting bigger, and and uh, all they need to do is just reach out, and uh, and we're going to be doing a lot of neat things. I hope um, I'm really really ex excited about the uh, the opportunity to start something from scratch that's not been done before, and and figure out a way how to make it uh, help the kids and help the parents and and help the tournament directors, like you know. Let, let's do something in an event. At the MGMA event was really cool. Uh, we were in Flint, Michigan. Not exactly, you know, a hotbed of of bowling events, bowling cities. Nice bowling center, great people, wonderful people. But they had the most entries they've had at an MGMA event since 2007. And, you know, it was interesting. I, Dasha was like, She's, do you think they had more entries because we were coming? I go, I don't know. Maybe I don't know, but but if if in your mind if you go I want to I want to do something that makes a difference, you would hope that more people would come when you're going to be there, and uh, so hopefully uh, hopefully we can do that and uh, hopefully we can make a difference. We just we just want to make a difference uh, when you're when you're 63 years old and and you're kind of washed up and uh, the old body doesn't work as good as it used to. Uh, you know, if, if you can still do something and enjoy it and make a difference and impact our sport, you know, you can't ask for much more than that. You really just can't. So I'm pumped. I love it. Uh, that's awesome. We, I run tournaments here in town and, and we run them on Saturdays and, and we start them at one o'clock because most of the center had kids before. Sure. And, and to be perfectly honest, that's just not a, much of a problem anymore. We could go earlier because... A lot of the places have lost a lot of the kids. Uh, without getting too deep, Chuck, wh where do you think, you know, you hear, okay, soccer, other sports, uh, we want to put them in baseball for money. What what do you think? Where, where are we losing these kids that should be starting bowling right away when they're, when they're in elementary school? I, I honestly think, I, I think most of it is misinformation. I, I, think, I think if kids and parents understood the, the uniqueness of bowling and how much they can earn in scholarships to help them go to college. I think more kids would do it. I, I really believe it's misinformation and, and not really understanding the unique opportunity. Cause you think about it, you can't go play baseball or play soccer or something else and earn scholarship money that goes into a, to an account that helps you go to college. Um, so it's, it's a unique situation with bowling. So I don't know if that's I, I'm, I, people ask me all the time. Do you think that's good or do you think that's bad um, that in, even in tournament play? Like, can do you think it's good that amateurs actually make money bowling Saturday night tournaments all over the place and they, they, they can earn money and a lot of other sports you can't? I, I, I don't know what's right or wrong. If I knew what's right or wrong, I'd be calling Chad Murphy every week and saying, Chad, uh, you got this wrong, bro. We, we need to do this. And I, maybe, but I don't, maybe not this week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know if he'd take my call this week, but he, he might. <laughs> He's had a tough week. He's had a busy week. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's misinformation more than anything. And, and let's be honest, the, the allure for young people to dream and always want to be a professional bowler, it's kind of not as bright as it used to be, right? So, you know, these guys bowl for like three months a year. And uh, if you don't 
have an amazing few months. I mean, think about it. Norm Duke led the Masters, and Norm Duke is still Norm Duke, and he didn't make the playoffs. And and the other thing that is, if he would have won today, he would have made the playoffs, and it would have knocked Bill O'Neill out of the playoffs. So, so you go. There's only 16 guys to get in the playoffs, yeah. and it's so the the allure. These kids going like when I was a little kid, I knew, and I, I raced motocross. I, I I I played football. I did everything. I did. I was a sports freak. Um, but I, I really always wanted, I felt like I want to be a pro bowler. This is what I want to do. And, and I worked really hard, re- worked really hard and, you know, and ended up bowling on tour for several years. And, you know, fortunately, um, I was intelligent enough to go finally go, eh, and I'm not really good enough to be out here and, and <laughs> living. And, and I worked for a wonderful company that said, Hey dude, uh, how would you like to mentor some of our players and teach them the ropes and and spend some time on tour and and that was in 2002 and uh and I've, I've got to make a great have a great career um working with some of the best bowlers that have ever held a bowling ball and uh and had a lot of fun doing it um so not everybody gets that that opportunity right there's there's only a few tour reps um i mean there's more now because Back in the day, the only two tour reps on tour were uh, Del Ballard and myself, and uh, nobody else. I mean, and and players were just, you know, different. They're different. Like now, uh, we had four tour reps at the Masters, four. Yep. And when the guy that took over for me called me and says, "Hey, man, you know, can you can you make the Masters since you're going to be in LA doing that clinic and everything with Bill?" And I'm like, uh, "No." I can't. I already have plans, you know, at home. This was three days before I'm flying to L.A. And I go, why do you need me? Or one of the other guys not coming? He goes, no, nah, we decided we want to have four guys. I said, Eric, we I've never had three guys at the Masters. In my entire career, I've never had three guys, much less four. So it's changing. You know, the players expect more help, more attention. Um. So it's, it's definitely different than it was back in the day. Yeah. I remember just, uh, going to Steve Klimkin or, or Tom Baker. That was about it. It was storm AMF and, and not much else uh, yeah. for my comp slips back in the day to try to, uh, figure out a way to make a show, but that never happened. Uh, but I'm not bitter about that. Unfortunately, um, <laughs> Chuck, before we move on to your other bowling endeavor, I'm going to shoot you one more question here. This sure. Is, this is one of Luke's favorite questions that I like to throw out. Uh, who was your favorite staffer to deal with, and who was your least favorite staffer to deal with? <laughs> oh God! Well, my favorite—it's um, a toss-up. Uh, to be honest, it's a toss-up between Parker Bone and Johnny Petraglia. Um, yeah. My God! Like, there's—you you have one of our staffers that I love to deal with coming on after me too. Bob Learn was great to deal with. I dealt with him at my prior company too. Um, cause he used to be on staff with track back in the day. So, um, so when, I, when I worked for, uh, Columbia industries before they sold to Ebonite, um, Bob Learn was on our staff and he was fantastic to work with too. Um, cause he was really good at figuring out on his own. Uh, but Johnny and Parker, you know, they, they were so appreciative when you came up with an idea or you, 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 you shared some knowledge with them that helped him have a little better week. They were so thankful, so appreciative. Um, and, and always treated you with respect. Always. There was never, never a foul word spoken, never, you know, blamed anybody else on their performance. And, and, uh, Parker's still that way. Um, I talked to Parker a lot this week, um, you know, as he was making a really great run at the masters and unfortunately lost around before the show. So, um, but it's still a great week for Parker and uh, super proud of him, proud of Norm. And, uh, you know, just, it was a good week. Um, least favorite. Hmm. <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's the popular it, one. <laughs> it's really an easy question. And, and you probably um, know, 
I, um, I, I think I've got an initial that I, I don't really want to throw it out on the air, but yeah, one of the initials a, a C. Mm, no, maybe not. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to say who I thought it might be. Um, no, no oh, C. No C. Um, no C. Okay. You don't I, have I, to answer this question he, if you don't like. <laughs> he's he's still a he's still a, a a recognizable guy, and we had a great run for for 15 years, and it just went really south in a real hurry, and uh, it just it just went ended very badly. So, um, but it was a great run for 15 okay, yeah, years. I, I've got it. I've got it now. It took, yeah, it yeah. took me a minute. I believe Luke probably yeah, already gonna, knew. Yeah, like, a couple initials. It, it took me yeah. a, it took me a moment. He's a uh, he was in the Luke, Luke, I, I, I saw the glimmer in Luke's eye when you asked that question. I, I'm pretty sure he knew who that was going to be before. It, uh, anyway. All right. Well, yeah. anyway, hey, listen, I, I had I had a lot of enjoyment working with a lot of players. And uh, even him, uh, we had some great times and great successes, uh, lots and lots of titles. And, uh, you know, it was it just ended in a really bad way. So all good uh, someone says who is it <laughs> no. if you can't figure that one That's out the uh, yeah. he, he said something about the rash of titles there so anyway we'll move it over to Luke, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll go from there luke take over the show before i get in more trouble yeah yeah so uh, talk about the youth stuff i think that uh you know when i was, when I was in youth leagues 20 odd years ago we didn't have near the the tournaments the the opportunities that the youth have today and again, from the, the Storm Youth Championships that you mentioned, the Brunswick Youth Experience now that you have. Uh, and it's just, I think that, uh, that, our, that our people that run those say that that's, you know, it's very refreshing to see, you know, because you, you've been on the, the pro tour with, with the pros at the top of the game. You've got seven brands worth of people, seven brands worth of uh, equipment to know. And at all times of the day, I mean, it's not like, when the U.S. Open it is a squad, it's not like you go do a squad and then you get off for the rest of the day like everybody else. You've got to know everything that's going on. You got to behind the scenes and what guys like what equipment and it's just so many different things. But now you're going to the, the youth side of things, and how how kind of refreshing is that, or how what what kind of parallel it might be might be too broad of a question, but. Uh, uh, but what what kind of your perspective on going from the pros to uh, the kids side of thing? Yeah, it it is it's so refreshing. It, it is it's the kids are so hungry to learn. They're 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 sponges. They just want every they want to learn everything they can learn. They don't you know it's it's they're just happy that you're there giving giving of yourself for them, and and they just feel they're, they're just very it's just different. It, it, and I, and believe me, I had an unbelievable career on the PBA tour. It was fantastic. And, and I, and I loved, I loved it, loved it, loved it. But I don't think Brian Graham said that when we talked about this thing, he said that this, this will be, forget all the major titles, forget all the, everything else, all the years, he goes, this will be the most important thing that you've ever done for your legacy. And, and he knows that it's important to me that when I, when I leave this sport or when I, when I leave this earth, that when, when people talk about the sport, I sure hope they remember that, that I gave everything. Like, I didn't leave anything. I, I gave it all. And, and I, I, I gave it all every event, every, every single time. I'm, you know, I'm, it's, it's just it's what I do and it's what I just love it. And the, the kids thing is just so it's exciting so far. Like I've had an absolute ball at every event so far. And, uh, and I, I hope they all continue going this well because it's kind of revived me a little bit. It makes me want to go to work. It makes me want to get up in the morning and make all the phone calls and all the emails and talk to people about, you know, what we're doing in next events and things like that. It's kind of revived my, my interest a lot. So it's definitely yeah. different. Yeah, I think that that's one of those things too. And it, I'm sure it's been a really great experience to uh, to help the best in the game at the highest level of the game. Uh, but at the same time, like you said, the uh, the vast majority of people that bowl are never going to be at the highest level of the game. And 
the youth are always the future. They're the ones that are coming up. And even if they don't bowl professionally, which, again, the vast majority aren't going to, it, it's still a kind of a group effort to prop up bowling as a whole, showcase bowling as a whole. Get And if you get them excited when they're that age, then it doesn't really matter if they become a pro at the best level of the game or right. if they're a, they're a couple times a week youth, you know, league bowler. That, that, that goes to a couple tournaments a year and bowls a couple times a week, and it's just they're bowling. So that's that's I mean the best <laughs> that's the best the best uh, yeah. solution or the best end game I guess that you could come to. Absolutely, and and I've never been that guy that that one of those you know I, listen I've, I've been with Brunswick for a long time, but you know some of my best friends in the world wear that logo you're wearing, mm-hmm. and uh, and 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 Storm is a unbelievable support system for the bowl for life foundation um gary and and leanne you know running the syc's and and just all the things they do if i go to an syc event and i'm there you know they they introduce me to the kids and they they say you know chuck's been with brunswick for a long time but you know he's he's about the youth bowling he's about you know the kids and parker's there with his kids they always introduce parker and 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 you know he you know, takes a little bow and they, you know, they're, they're, I I think the people that really get it and the people that are in this thing for the right reasons, they don't worry that much about what logo they wear on their chest. You know, I, I, listen, I'm very fortunate. I get to work for a great company. Um, but you know, the people that work for storm work for a great company too, filled with wonderful people and people who do great things for our sport. So I, I, just not that guy and, and never have been. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm proud that, that, uh, Brunswick and storm are both big sponsors for the bowl for life foundation. And, uh, I'm really proud of that. And it may, it means a lot to me. And so many of the Jersey companies are sponsors of the bowl for life foundation, you know, yeah. uh, all just about all of them. I am bowling. That's what I'm wearing right now. And, uh, cool wick and, and, uh, Mm-hmm. Bolify, you know, they're, they're, they're all sponsors of the Bowl for Life Foundation, right? Mm-hmm. So my, my whole motto when I started the Bowl for Life Foundation was break down the barriers. Let's break down the barriers that are sport that people that have a different agenda in our sport have put up. Because Bill Chrisman and Brent Perrier and Corey Dykstra have never put up those kind of barriers. Never. They work together, you know. They have a great relationship. They're friends. Uh, we we've eaten dinner together many times. Uh, we've enjoyed a beverage uh, more times than I care to remember, and maybe some I don't. And so it's it's just. <laughs> but that's that's the people that are in our sport. You know, bowlers are people, and and they're part of our sport. And every single bowler matters. Every single bowler matters. I don't. I don't care what ball they throw or what logo they wear. Yeah. All right, Chuck. Uh, thanks for staying on a little extra here, and a little bit later at the start here. Everybody's been a little bit chatty today. Uh, speaking of the chat, people are inundating us, wanting to know who I was thinking about, and I'll, I'll reveal it because mine was kind of in a joking way. I didn't think of the obvious answer. That's that's on me. But uh, the obvious answer to me would be Jason Couch. That guy's. Just terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Jason Couch, even I don't even know if he was ever mean to his reps because he was he's been with Evan I his whole career. So I don't know if he ever was mean to Dell when Dell was the rep for Evan I, I I'm gonna guess they had an interesting relationship, but when he when he left the tour and he did his little stint at trying to be a tour rep. It was quite interesting uh, being on the other side, watching him try and be a tour rep. Uh, it was, I love Jason like a brother, but that was just not going well. It was just not going well. So, uh, you know, thankfully he's uh, doing something different now. And uh, the tour rep, tour rep life just was not for Jason. So. Jason, if you're watching, uh, we kid because we care. Uh, you're, you're, uh, were nice to me when I was on tour and I'll just leave it at that. So <laughs> Chuck, we got to move along. We got some other people waiting in the queue here. So, uh, I want to take a moment and thank you for coming on the show and through bowl for life and, and, 
uh, the Brunswick youth experience. You, you're doing great things, and, and you keep doing that for, for Bowl, and we appreciate it. Thank you. Say hi to Bob and to uh, to Jody, and uh, Bob, congratulate her for uh, for winning the uh, winning the Bob, Queens Bob, senior Queens. Is, is Bobby in the queue right yeah. now? All right, Bob. we're gonna, we're going to try something for the first time here on the uh, on the Bowler Show with our new yeah. technology. We're going to try to bring Bob in here uh, real quick. Any anything you got to say to Bob? Uh, Luke, are we able to do that? Yeah, let's pop oh it my in here. Oh, there we go. Goodness hey, Man, he gets better looking every day, doesn't he? Right, right. Good lighting, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, keep up the great work with your with your program there, buddy. And uh, we're proud that you're wearing that logo. And I'm proud you're my friend, man. Well, I'll tell you what. I'm excited to see what you're doing with the youth. Once again, not even Bull for Life, but now you're into the Brunswick Youth experience. And, uh, you know, that's something that we have a shared passion for. So as I told you before, let me know what I can do to be part of it. I'll be yelling. I promise you. All right, guys, have a great rest of your night. All right, Chuck. Once again, Chuck Gardner from Brunswick joining the show. And uh, a first for us, bringing in uh, another guest. we got to do that more often. Look, we've got guys yeah, in yeah. the queue that are, that are connected like Chuck and Bob. We need to do that a little bit more. So Yeah, definitely. I, I can put up to six people on here, I believe. That can get pretty interesting depending on who it is. But All right, well, Bob did not get his proper introduction. I had uh, all set up here with uh, – with what we just did there. But Bob, uh, formally, welcome to the Bowler Show, sir. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having me back. All right. My first question I like to ask of guys who, who bowled back in the 80s and uh, 90s when I did is, do you Way remember back. me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were the guy that uh, you were, was looking around for uh, some, from help from Chuck, right? Is that the guy that was helping you, right? Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's yeah. possibly me. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, <laughs> I was the, I was the young kid chasing you. I remember I, I've got a bowling pin that you signed that said uh, was talking about three hundreds and it said you'll never catch me and and it was true. I never <laughs> had that's that's a true story. I, I don't it's remember right. where that was, but um, let's stay in the coaching vein here. You you talked about Chuck and the good things he's doing. Uh, you're doing a lot of that nowadays. You're heading across the pond here soon, from what I, what I hear. Uh, take a moment and talk about what you're doing in the coaching world. Well, I've been a college coach for the past five years. Uh, Martin Methodist College is uh, what I signed on for. They became UT Southern last July, so uh, now part of the UT system. And, uh, you know, we've had a lot of fun with growing the program. Uh, I was looking to get into the college coaching. I worked with uh, Brian O'Keefe when I was down at USBC Coach. And when he got into the program of McKendry, uh, I had a conversation with him because you need to be doing this. This is exactly uh, what you would be really good at. And so decided to start looking around for a program. And when uh, I found a college that was just south of Nashville, I'm like, I think I could live in that area. I think we could do that. And uh, it was also a program that was smaller and needed uh, to grow. And so taking a, a program that was fledgling and and try to make it into uh, uh, a team that could win a national championship. We're right there. All right. Well, talk, talk a little bit about, about that, your favorite parts of coaching. Uh, adults, kids, or, or just anybody? Well, I mean, anybody. I mean, honestly, um, I wish I would have been able to get a hold of some really good coaching when I was younger. It was trial and error that really got me uh, to where I was, uh, you know, on, out on tour. And at, at a cost early on, right? Um, but I have a lot of experience, um, and I like to share that experience. I like to uh, cut that learning curve and uh, get people inspired up uh, to stay in bowling and, and want to, you know, continue to bowl. Like Chuck said, uh, it's really about just growing the sport, trying to get as many people excited about it. And on the youth side, certainly most important thing for me is when it comes to college, I mean, these kids are like, I want to go bowl out on tour. I'm like, listen. Talk to me after four years. Don't be jumping out of this program. Don't be going out there to bowl. Because I'll tell you, when I came to the conclusion that my tour days were over uh, in 2005, um, it wasn't easy to make that, you know, move back into uh, the other side. And uh, as, a, as it were, I decided to stay in bowling because um, it was something that I was good at, something I had connections in. But for me to go outside and try to get – uh, something started would have been very, very difficult because back in 1980, when I, you know, left, uh, when I came out on tour, 
I didn't, I didn't go to college. I had a scar, uh, uh, I had scholarship to New York City School of Art, but I had a guy who said, hey, I'm going to put you out of the for three years. I guarantee it. If you want to go, it's offered to you now. Uh, and that's it. I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. I may never have a chance to do that. And so I came out of that without having a, a college degree. And today you need that. Yeah, when you're teaching these kids, what what are some of your core fundamentals? Are you, are you more on the physical side or the mental side of bowling? Well, of course, mental is ultimately where you need to get to. Um, but honestly, understanding lane play and ball motion, really getting them to see how things work. And when you talk about having 12 bowling balls, you know, having an idea of what you need to get into and not just guessing at it, right? Um, these kids can throw it really, really well. They're so uh, more, more well-versed than we were growing up because of all the tournaments, all the patterns they get the bowl on, uh, all the experience they come in with uh, that, you know, basically I came out of junior leagues and went out on tour. And there was really nowhere in between for me to really uh, to, to get the knowledge like these kids have today. One, we didn't know what the patterns were back then. We had the spray gun and then we had phantom reports if they were going to be different and that's all we knew. We went in pretty blind every week. And, you know, you talk about some of the tournaments, uh, you know, that kids bowl in and they don't get to know the pattern. And you're always like, well, you know, it would be nice if we knew what pattern it was. Yeah, I thought the same thing for many years <laughs> when I was in the So they get to work out on patterns. They get familiar with patterns. Then they get to come out on tour and bowl on similar patterns. So they're they're definitely uh, more, you know, more, more well prepared. Um, and I've got a couple of kids in my lineup now that I, I believe will go out and, and have some success if they want to bowl. But most importantly, they they stay with bowling. They're going to have fun being competitive bowlers on the weekends. Um, you know, and as a coach, I think probably the biggest thing you get to be a part of is a mentoring. You really get to change people. Uh, and I think that's really been the greatest benefit for me. All right, well, let's uh, let's hop in the old Wayback Machine and let's go to 1996 for the Erie Flagship Open. Uh, it seemed to me there was a couple of uh, amazing things that happened during that tournament. I don't even know where to begin. Just just talk a little bit about that week there in Erie and just uh, what it means to you even talking about it today. Well, you know, as a kid, you always dreamt of, of being able to strike out in the 10th to win the Erie Open, you know, and that was my practice routine and there was no uh, event until uh, the early 90s and so um, when that came to town even though I wasn't on tour at the time I mean it was a big thing that came to town and uh, of course I wanted to live out that dream and uh, in 1996 I, I had the opportunity to do that um, our crowds in Erie were amazing from the practice session on it was a packed house and anybody who's ever bowled there, you know, would still talk about it and, and how, how it was a great bowling town to be from. And uh, I think, you know, that's really what pushed me uh, on the tour, really, is because of the area that I grew up in. Um, so that day, uh, it was it was a I narrowly made the show. I made a run from behind, had a, a big run at the show. Pete Weber actually needed. Uh, strike an attempt to knock me off the show, left the four pin. Wow. And uh, as I'm sitting, and so I just snuck on the show. And then looking at the lineup, I'm like, okay, let me see. Uh, I got I got Johnny Petraglia, Johnny Mazza, uh, <laughs> Parker Bone, and Randy Peterson. It's not going to be an easy day. But, you know, uh, I thought, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to make the most of it. Have fun as much as possible. Go out there and, and just not uh embarrass myself and who knows who knows maybe something great will happen well something great did happen and uh, i want you to talk after i ask you this other question talk about the the bowling in the convention center or the, whatever it was called but i think the part that people don't remember about the show and, and the part that sticks out to me is is you threw 44 or 48 strikes and every 10th frame, if you didn't strike, you you were going to lose the match. I don't think people remember that. They don't, you know, they see your scores and they think, well, I just coasted victory. That was the furthest thing. It was amazing. You had to strike in every 10th frame just to win your match. That's how high scoring it was that day. 
Yeah, well, you know, the the Tulio Center, um, we had forty five hundred people there and wow. Yeah. More than half of those people I knew I knew by name, mm-hmm. you know, and the energy, even if you watch a show today, you can kind of sense how much energy there was in that arena setting uh, that day. And I just fed off of that. I mean, really, I'll be honest, uh, when we were practicing, Randy Peterson and myself, we really didn't have a very good look on the left lane. In fact, we kept washing out on the left lane and uh, kind of saw what the left side had. I'm like, well, it's going to be a short day. And he goes, <laughs> he said, yeah, you know, just enjoy, enjoy as long as you can, you know, as long as you have. And so in my mind, I'm thinking 220 is a good game. I really was because the left lane was just, I just wasn't seeing it. Switched the ball with two shots left in practice. And all of a sudden I had a spot on the left lane I saw that I could see. So when I had the first four in the first game, I'm thinking, okay, I got the 220 if I just stay clean. And I wasn't really thinking about anything more. One shot at a time after that, I never, ever would have dreamed that that day was going to be as high scoring as it was and that it was obviously going to be uh, what it ended up being for myself. Striking out in the 10th, again, that was really feeding off the, the crowd. If you can remember, I was giving the old, you know, two more, one more. I was just having fun with it. I was just pumped. And uh, I wasn't nervous at all. I can tell you that when I went up for the shot uh, for three hundred dollars and $100,000, I did say to myself, you know, hey, just don't screw this up, dummy. You know, you're going you're gonna to regret it if you do. Reflecting back on Brian Goebel's 296 at the true value, I just didn't want to be that, you know, have that experience. So I went up there and, uh, you know, when I let go of it, I'm like, oh, that that's good. That's good. That's 10, you know. And so um, that really, at the, at the end of that game, I'll be honest, I was kind of spent. There was a lot of energy and we had this 10-minute break. They gave me the check and they did it, ran all these commercials. And then a video we had run the day before uh, hunting with my, my son uh they kind of did this a little piece before we you know knew i was even going to make the show so all this time and i come out and i go 10 pin strike 10 pin and then we had a commercial break my wife goes what are you doing i said what do you mean what am i doing i just want to hurt grand you know in front of my home house she goes yeah but i mean you want to win this right i go well, of course she goes well you better change something and so i thought about it and i go you know what i i'm going to make a ball change because those two went kind of flat 10. So I'd switch balls and I strung out the rest of the game to win by two pins against yeah. Maza, and then continue to go on the rest of the day with that ball. So I did make a ball based off of the two misses that I had early in my four game set. Wow, that's something that, that I didn't know. And, you know, I remember the, the pictures of Ron Palami clapping and, and Stacy, of course, going crazy. But the thing I remember the most is you lifting up Johnny Petraglia. Are, are you still hurting from that hug? <laughs> didn't even feel him. <laughs> <laughs> he was, didn't feel a thing. Uh, that's how pumped I was. I mean, you know, I could have, I could have jumped out of my own clothes, you know, <laughs> after I shot 300. So holding on, picking up Johnny Petraglia was, it was just, uh, was just a moment that I don't even, barely remember doing so, but it was exciting to do that in front of my hometown. I look at that now and I see a lot of people that are no longer here. Both my mom and my mother and father have passed. Uh, the owner of the bone center, which was like, like another family to me who's passed and then many others in that crowd. So I look back there now reflective on you know, those people that were there cheering me on that day. And I think I get more from that than anything. Yeah, and, uh, so going back a little bit now, that that's some of my my favorite memories. I'm I'm only forty, but that's uh, I really remember those shows that were in the the convention centers. They set up the four lanes to have the TV show. How interesting was that? Because obviously you bowl in the bowling center, and then all of a sudden you go to these convention centers where they set up these these four lanes or whatever. How wild was that sometimes going from okay we know the the lanes we know the the pattern then all of a sudden you get on these four lanes that are set up specifically for the tv show that how how different were they sometimes going from the center to these specific lanes in the convention center for the tv shows 
every uh, I made a lot of shows uh, in the arena finals, and I would think all but one, the lanes hooked up quite a bit more. Uh, with the, I mean, obviously the the lanes have only been a, a couple of days old, and uh, when you put in new lanes, they, you know there is a higher friction value initially until they it almost like they need oil for a couple of weeks until they start settling down. So they always hooked more. Uh, the first time I made mean, arena files, I thought, you know, geez, you know, they, why they change them so much, you know, and <laughs> not really looking at everything, just, Hey, what, what happened to my shot? You know? Um, but when you're in that setting for me, it was like, I was doing more of an exhibition with everyone there. Uh, uh, and well, the first time we had down lane seating was that day in Erie in 1996, mm -hmm. the very okay. first arena finals was contested in Erie. The tournament uh, director from Erie, uh, George Warren, he's the one that came up with the idea. You talked to a guy from AMF, Rod Millett, and uh, and uh, and they talked about how can they make this happen, you know, for a TV show because Erie would support it, and that's how it that's how it started in Erie. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the one tricky one was that we had a new surface we've never bowled on uh, on tour, VIA. Mm -hmm. And they sponsored one year of arena finals. And VIA is a much higher friction surface. And the ball hooks a lot more on it. And, you know, it's barely recognizable to what you bowled on. Well, <laughs> mistakes, made, mistakes were made the first time around. Uh, and then the second time, you're like, OK, I need to drill stuff that's going to be a lot weaker to to match up to what we're bowling on because of the surface alone. So, and, and we never bowled on via. So you're saying, you know, what do you do when you bowled in the center all week and then you hit this? Well, you have a surface you've never seen before. So that's part of it. The other is topography was pretty good in the arena finals. Those lanes are pretty darn flat, Yeah. you know? So you look at that side of it, scoring was definitely higher in arena settings. Um, and I can honestly say, I mean, I'm not, I'm not so certain that they were, they were easier as far as conditioning wise. I just think that that whole atmosphere uh, enabled more to happen. Yeah. Now moving on a little bit past that is something that uh, Norm Duke's going through right now is something that Walter and Pete and some of those guys have, have been through here recently, but how tricky is it to decide when your, I guess your time is done? so to speak. I mean, because do you want to go out on top? Do you not want to drag it out too far and say, you know, have a bad couple of years and then think, okay, we'll just kind of limp to the finish line, I guess. Uh, but that's the one thing that, that I'm kind of, that's kind of interesting to me. Again, I'm only 40, so it's not, I think a lot of people older than me would think 40 was a pretty good time. And then when you're younger than 40, you think, gosh, that's old, but it's really, it, it, it's pretty okay. But you know, I still think that I can do a lot of things now that I that I really can't. And how do you how do you get to that point where you figure out, you know what, it, it's it's time to hang it up for the the kids tour, I guess. Uh, how how do you make that decision? What was that like for you? Well, for me, it was easy because I had uh, older kids. When uh, my youngest was finishing high school and going into college, and my son had just gone through college, and when I had a bad year there. I'm like, okay, I think I need to start doing something else fun to support my family. Right. So I immediately shifted gears and uh, I didn't, I hardly bowled for the next six years. I didn't, I bowled like, not any bowl league, I didn't, I didn't practice, but if a tour stop came within uh, an hour, I might just go just really more so to go see the guys say, Hey, and hang out a little bit. Uh, and I had some success doing that, but um, I think a lot of guys that you've seen that stayed a while, you're talking about small group. You have Walter Ray, who was still winning and has obviously won a lot of titles more than anybody. Norm Duke was still winning. Um, P. Weber was still winning. Uh, and Leto was still winning. And they continued to compete right up until the senior tour. And then now the super senior tour, I mean, you're talking about – the I would have to say the greatest generation uh, of bowlers simply because they were so good for so long. Yeah. 
you look at Roth and Holman, those guys, they were in their thirties and they were, they were like backing off in their late thirties, you know? Uh, and these guys just kept going and call it equipment or whatever you want. But I mean, these guys are already good and they're able to do so many things with a bowling ball uh, that they were able to continue their, their career for much longer than I, um, well, I just didn't even want to. I just like, I got to do the right thing here and take care of my family. Yeah. So, you know, it is unprecedented to see these guys getting closer to 60 and still making TV shows. As you know, that would have been uh, a record if Norm would have won, you know? And, uh, you know, I, like you said, I'm, like next week I'm 60. So, I, and I don't feel 60. I certainly can <laughs> still throw the ball uh like a much younger person and uh, i feel like i could still be pretty competitive if i did want to bowl some of the young stuff but why would i want to you know i just i enjoy bowling the senior tour i like the competitive nature and it's a little more friendly atmosphere than bowling against the young guys there they are they uh they are it's really difficult like chuck said there's only like 10 people that are really going to make uh, a decent living right um, yeah. some of the same people you see in some of the tournaments that they have, you know, it's keeping the same people, uh, involved with those events. And that's how they make a living. It's not as, as easy to make a living as it was back when I started. And it seemed like a great idea. We had 35, 36 tournaments a year. And so you only had to get hot a couple, a couple of weeks out of that and, and still, you know, make some money doing it. But like he said, you're bowling, I don't know, 10 events. 12 events, it's not a lot. Yeah. So uh, it's really hard to make ends meet otherwise. So I, uh, I, I enjoy seeing the talent, what those guys could do with a bowling ball, um, coach with Team USA and getting to work with those players. Uh, it's great just to see what they can do. I love it. Um, and I get to share uh, some of my knowledge with them even, you know, because I've seen more than they have, right? And uh, and um, I, I guess from trial and error, I've, I've taught myself enough things that I can help others. All right, Bob, well, that's, uh, that's great to hear about all the coaching stuff and everything that you're doing. Um, we do have one question here that's coming from our Double J's Pro Shop chat line. Uh, the listener would like to know if you have any 300s with your opposite hand. <laughs> well, I, uh, I have thrown a 300 with my left hand. Um, I broke my right hand twice, uh, right, right above the thumb. Uh, once wrestling in high school, the following year playing football. And, that, and then I dropped both sports so I could continue to bowl. So I had to bowl left-handed both those seasons. Huh. I have. And uh, um, not that I'd want to go back to doing it now, but, uh, you know, I, if I was hungry, I wanted to bowl good, and I practiced like crazy just to – to be as good as I could as a left-hander, and yeah. Well, that's interesting because uh, I don't know if you know this, Luke and I have the only bowling show where the hosts both have uh, multiple 300s with both hands. So, and, and you know, I may never catch it for total 300s, but I have, how many, how many do you have, Luke? Two or three left-handed? Yeah, two left-handed. He's got two, and he's got a long way to go. He's 40. I'm 58. I actually have yeah. 10 uh, with my opposite oh, hand, and it's actually injury injury related too. So, um, you, you can't talk about three hundreds until you catch me left handed. How about that? <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. All right, Bob. Thanks again, all you guys, uh, Chuck, yourself, and and Parker and Johnny and everybody I've ever met with Brunswick's uh, great for the game, and you guys are doing great things. So keep up the good work, and uh, we'll check what check back with you here real soon. Thank you, guys. Appreciate what you do. All right. Bob Learn, great guy, 1996 Erie flagship open winner, uh, maybe yeah. the most famous. I saw it was listed as ninth on the PBA moments list. I thought it probably should have been a little higher, yeah. but 276 point five average on the day. Uh, that's just amazing, and, and having a strike each each tenth frame to get there is amazing too. But uh, Luke, we better move along here. We're running a little behind uh, this week here on the Bowler Show. Yeah, uh, yeah. Everybody's been patient. Everybody's been uh, very patient, and uh, people have been a little bit chatty. Now, I'm not going to lie. That's a good thing for the yeah. show. We, we want to let people tell their story on the show. They're not here to listen to us. They're here to listen to uh, our guests. So let's uh, let's bring in the anchor person of the show. Uh, she's the 2022 Senior Queens Champ. She's also a Storm Staffer. 
Her name is Jody Westner. Jody, welcome to the Bowler Show. Well, thank you for having me. I thought I, I just had 30 seconds and I'm done. So <laughs> thanks. We, we, no, we no longer are on the radio, so we have no restrictions on time. So uh, there you go. We, we, can, we can do whatever we want. Now, should I address you as uh, the queen, Jody, or just the? <laughs> I think the is fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, like the Ohio State. I know you're a fan of, of Ohio State yeah. for some unknown reason. And uh, I'll, for I don't know where. Let's talk about that to, at the start here. Where did when did people start calling you the Jody Westner? I have no idea, and, and it might be from the Ohio State Buckeyes. I don't know. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's been a, a little bit of a joke for a while. So. I'll take well, that it. Makes, that makes that <laughs> makes sense, and uh, I'll I'll throw out another uh, another form of flattery here. When I saw you bowling the the senior queens, I, I didn't know you were fifty, and I'm sure not, a lot of other people didn't either. So um, that that was interesting to see. But uh, talk about talk about winning the senior queens. I know we you know it's same format as we saw this week. Um, take us take yes. us through your week. Yeah, it was. Uh... A uh, couple years coming, actually. So I turned 52, uh, almost two and a half years ago. Uh, the Senior Queens was canceled the last two years. So I didn't get an opportunity to bowl. Um, and then uh, definitely wanted to take advantage of this year's opportunity. Def uh, it's, it's like the Masters that we just watched, um, except that we cut to 32 bowlers instead of the 64. Uh, the regular queens does cut to the 64, um, but the senior queens cut to 32. Same format, three game matches. Um, we bowled five games. We didn't spread them over three days, though. We spread them only over two days. So we bowled. The first round was on a fresh, of course. Everyone bowled at the same time. And then we came back after a lunch break and then bowled on the burn. So they didn't re-oil in between. We bowled 10 games the first day and then five more games on Sunday morning, and then they cut to the top 32 for the three game total pin matches. Uh, so it was it was a lot, it was pretty compact into three days, which I like. Um, I'm not a big fan of the short five game sprints. <laughs> I do like the longer formats, I love the US Open. Um, so the Queens, I've, I've had some success in the regular Queens, I've also struggled because of the five game, just five games per day. Um, just getting my feet under me and getting my legs under me. So um, I did like the two rounds on the first day, bowling on the burn, the second squad. So I felt pretty comfortable. I finished in uh, second each squad. <laughs> so the ladies bowling to my right, Sharon Powers um, and Linda Wabon, uh, led both the first two squads and then Sharon led again on Sunday. So I was, uh, I had something motivating me right next to me and they kept me going and um, it didn't really matter as long as you got in, but I certainly wanted to be as high as I could in the standings um, to just have a better opportunity to, to win some matches. And then we bowled the matches starting on Sunday afternoon. I went undefeated the first two and then I was done for the day and then won three more on, on Monday to make the show to be the number one seed against uh, Lucy. And then I ended up bowling against Lucy in the final set. So that was awesome. Awesome story there. Yeah, uh, Lucy Sandlin's one of my one of my favorite bowlers of all time. Um, did you have any close matches? Where or did you, did you kind of just waltz your way through, or did you have some real close <laughs> matches, low, high scoring? Uh, my first match, I uh, shot seven forty, <laughs> so I came out guns a blazing, you know, and um, that was that was my highest set. Um, after that, um, I had some decent matches. I had six sixty six nineties. I did have a couple close. The last, um, the first one on Monday morning was close with Ann Coleman. She's also from Ohio. Um, I was ahead of her by, and I don't know the number for sure, 60 some pins maybe. She threw the front nine at me the third game. And I actually had to double in the 10th to shut her out and I did. <laughs> so wow. um, she, came, she definitely uh, switched to the right ball the second game and I'm glad she didn't throw it the first game. I told her that multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that was good. Um, so that was my very first match. And then um, actually that was on Sunday afternoon and then I bowled Tish and um, we had a decently close match. I'm, I, I was ahead of her pretty much the whole time, but you know, it's Tish and she finds a <laughs> finds it and can string some strikes together. So um, I'm not sure what the, the total ended up being, maybe 30 or 40 pins. 
And then my next match, um, I did bowl against, uh, I think it was the fourth match, up against Carmen and uh, Aguirre. And that was the one I struggled the most in. I think I had um, 580, 590, something like that. I would 710 twice on the right lane. I don't know what pair they bowled on today in the Masters finals, but I was thinking it was 41 and 42, and that was that pair. And I could see where um, Simo actually switched to something that was going to be a little quicker in the back on the right lane. And I, I could see that because I just bowled on that pair, and I, I, I'm pretty sure that was, that was the same pair. So I struggled a bit. Um, ended up that she needed a strike and she got nine. So got through that match and then I bowled Lucy and we just had fun. Lucy, <laughs> Lucy's so much fun to bowl with and it just relaxed me so much bowling for the, for the first and second spot. You know, you're already on the show. Um, you can try to relax a little bit, but you also want that number one seed. And especially in the senior Queens where they changed it, I think a few years ago where I had to lose twice. So it gives you that little cushion. You don't want to have to use it, but yeah. It, it definitely is a little cushion there. So it was a lot of fun, though. Well, I see you post uh, a little bit about the, the company you work for and how, how great they are to allow you to uh, do some things in the bowling world and bowl on the weekends and, and travel. Uh, did you ever have any thoughts originally, uh, you know, when you were younger about the, the LPBT tour? I bowled um, some stops. I never bowled full time. I had been working full time right out of high school. Um, I didn't go to college, so I didn't bowl for college. Um, I just took the opportunity when there were tournaments close uh, to hit those tournaments and, and do what I could there and had some success in several of them. So it kind of kept that fire alive where I can compete, you know, even though I didn't have um, kind of the background that everyone else had. But um, when the new tour came back out, when after I had folded and came back, I talked to my employer and I was able to be able to work from the road and bowl pretty much all of the stops for several years. So it was a great opportunity. I had some success. I had um, some struggles. It you know was hit and miss. Um, didn't make any of those shows um, for the PWBA shows, but uh, I did make a run at the U.S. Open show the one year. So that was fun. All right. Uh, thank you for handling that question so diplomatically. Apparently, my research department and myself. Uh, I'm going to ding myself for that question. Uh, I'll be kicking myself later. I, I had some stuff written down about a couple of things you've done. I, I have no idea uh, why I asked that the way I did. But uh, anyway, let's move on to today. What's, uh, what's up for you this year on the PWBA? Uh, so for this year, I'm going to bowl the first couple of stops. So I'll bowl the Rockford, uh, which is the first stop, and then the Queens. And then I'll miss the next one, which is an Egan, which I really love bowling there. Um, and, but we're going to be at the Open Championships for Memorial Day weekend. And then I'll take a couple of weeks off. Uh, we, we actually bought a camper last year. So part of my summers are spent at the lake, which I think I told you that's where I was coming from <laughs> today. So I could come on a little bit later tonight and um, spend a couple of weeks there. And then I'll still bowl, you know, summer leagues and some tournaments locally. Uh, then go and bowl the U.S. Open and then the Lucy, and then the Dallas Classic Series. So seven seven tournaments out of 12 I'll hit this summer. Yeah, I think that's, that's kind of interesting that uh, I had no idea you were 50 either. And so <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll tell everybody that we have on this, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of women's bowling. I always have been. I, I, I just think it's bowling in, in, in its purest form. And I was, I was crushed when the, the, when the PWBA – uh, went away for a while, obviously not as crushed as the women that <laughs> made their living doing it. Right. But uh, um, again, you said you kind of, you kind of work through it. You kind of work things or you kind of worked and then you, you hit the stops that you could, but it wasn't really your kind of, it wasn't your living, so to speak. So uh, if anybody that goes and looks up your Wikipedia page, which has to be cool to have a Wikipedia page in the first place, but <laughs> Um, talk about some of the other things that you've done just in general, you know, SANS PBA or PWBA. So we did have the PBA women's series that they started up kind of in between when the PWBA was on hiatus. And I did uh, have the opportunity to win one of those in Baltimore. So that was really uh, something cool. Um, I had a really great year. I, I made the women's series um, 
tour, basically, we had to qualify by bowling the US Open, made the US Open show and qualified for the women's series. And then I think you mentioned Jason Couch's name earlier, ended up beating him, if you're not remembering, um, in a regional (laughs) in Cincinnati Mm -hmm. that same year. And then I went on at the end of the year to win in Baltimore. So had a really great year. And you keep mentioning you're 40. And that was, I think I was 39. And I was like, what am I going to do? I'm about at the end of my career. Am I going to keep bowling? And then decided to win basically everything I bowled in that year. So it was just crazy. Um, I bowled a hoinky, won a couple of (laughs) hoinky um, events as well. So um, that kind of boosted me back into, yeah, I can, I can still do this. (laughs) Won the Rodman, you know, so it was really a really strange year, um, but it helped me build my confidence back. And then um, when the tour came back, I, I said, why not? So I, I bowl in as much as I can, you know, locally and within the state. And I live just south of Michigan. So I'll go up in, into Michigan and bowl as much as I can as well. And Fort Wayne, there's some great tournaments in Fort Wayne. There's a couple of um, great friends of mine that run some tournaments in Fort Wayne. So I'll go over there and bowl as much as I can, too. Yeah, it's kind of interesting with the senior queens is that we're used to Lucy and Robin and Tish. And you don't even need to say their last names because you know exactly right. who you're <laughs> talking about. Uh, but on the flip side, you know, going back, you know, with the with the the new PWBA tour, I guess, who were some of your favorites to watch to bowl against uh, from a, a, some of the, the the younger bowlers that are kind of coming up? Who did I watch specifically? Or, no, or, yeah, who who uh, of the of the new? Well, yeah, I guess that could be a question when when you were when you were younger. Who did you watch coming up, and then who do you like to watch now of the younger crew that's kind of coming up in the PWBA? PWBA ranks now. Sure. Yeah. When I was, when I started bowling in the, in the LPBT at the time, you know, Leanne was certainly out there. Not that a lot of the women aren't a lot older than me, but they were definitely more well-known um, mm-hmm. and ha- had a lot of um, opportunities and took a lot of opportunities and won a lot of tournaments. So Leanne, um, Linda Barnes, uh, Kim Kearney were three of the ones that I really watched and looked up to a lot. I had a great opportunity, uh, met Lisa Bishop when I was bowling in MJ, MJMAs and JTBAs. Um, and she asked me to bowl or her team asked me to bowl in Detroit. So I, for three years, I drove to Detroit twice a week and bowled. And that's really what I think kickstarted uh, my opportunities and kind of got my foot in the door, I'd say. Um, bowling with Alita, Michelle, uh, Marianne Rupo. Cheryl Daniels, you know, <laughs> it was yeah. an awesome team. We bowled in some um, of the uh, the team challenges, won a couple of those. Actually, one with Jeannie Nacarado, she bowled for Alita in one of the national stops because Alita couldn't bowl, and we ended up winning. So had a lot of great opportunities there to, to learn from them and uh, kind of took advantage of that, and that's when I really started bowling. So those were – really for me personally, I think coming up today, you know, you can always look at, you know, Kelly and Liz and Shannon O'Keefe um, and, you know, Stephanie, you know, I mean, so I, I like to keep my game simple. So, you know, the, the, the less you have to worry about the better <laughs> in my opinion. And that's what I've always learned from my parents and um, from everyone that I've worked with. So I always look to, to the people that really have a simple game uh, for the most part, but then you have, you know, some of the Daria and Verity who just are amazing to watch throw a bowling ball. So, um, and Jordan, Richard, you know, I mean, it's just, it's really cool to, to watch the women, the women who, how they've evolved, just like the men have, you know, with the two handers, you don't, we don't have the two handers on our side, but we have some women that pretty have some pretty high rev rate. They can, they they can open up a lane for sure. Yeah. Um, And and again, some of my, Verity is one of my favorites to watch, and she goes, especially if you follow her on social media, she goes from it from, she's very positive, she puts a lot of stuff in about the, the drills that she does and the work behind the scenes. She doesn't like, oh, hey, I'm throwing a strike with the newest bowling ball that's out there. She puts in, she shows a lot of the work behind the scenes, but then I also like somebody uh, like Julia Bond, who doesn't have, she's got a very simple, very kind of low-rev game, almost a la Carolyn Doran Ballard from back when. And I love watching the smaller adjustments when you don't have the power to just kind of will the pins down or you just, I, I get a little tired of kind of watching somebody just overpower the pins. I love 
seeing the smaller adjustments and the little nuances and the things that somebody like Julia has to do because she doesn't have the, you know, the big rev rate to just, you know, throw the pins everywhere. I love watching that type of bowling. And so that's, you know, I, I do appreciate what, what Verity does. And then, you know, Michelle Feldman, I think was one of the ones back when yeah. that had a lot higher rev rate than a lot of the other women. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but still, you know, you can have somebody like Carolyn Doran, Doran Ballard and now again, you know, somebody like Julia Bond that uh, that just they, they have that sixth sense about getting the pins down, not, yes. you know, and that that's the thing that's that's always really impressed me is just getting the pins down and how how uh, nuanced that that and how in depth that kind of is sometimes, I guess, if you understand what I'm saying. Totally. I mean, I sit there in awe while I'm bowling against them. I'm like, how are they doing that? How are they getting their ball to go through the pins like that? And, you know, and, and when they're off hits carry and, you know, it's amazing, you know, but it is, it's, it, like you said, it's, it can be very simple. Um, just a tweak here or a tweak there, or just making sure you have the right ball, the right surface, you know, just matching up completely. But it, it is amazing. I mean, I'm in awe every time I bowl against them. <laughs> and so, uh, I just keep trying to learn as much as I can, even even at 52. I, you know, I'm still gonna compete as much as I can possibly compete for as long as I can. Listening to Bob, it was interesting because now they have the PBA 60 tournaments, and uh, I haven't bowled in any PBA 50 tournaments, but why not? Maybe I'll uh, take a little dip in there. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to uh, stay away from those for a while until I get to. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we'll keep you out of those for a while. Uh, Jody, before we let you go, I got a couple items in the chat real quick. Uh, you sure. want to answer a couple of chat questions? Absolutely. All right. The first question is, where is the tiara right now and why are you not wearing it? Oh, goodness. I had it ready just in case. There you go. Because they, they made me put it on on Friday for the, the morning bolt. So I figured I would have it ready. So there you go. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Very, very nice. You check that one off the box. Yeah. And this will just be kind of a personal one. I've got a friend here in town who's a big fan of yours. He's crossed with you a couple of times. You probably wouldn't remember, but uh, I would get in a lot of trouble if I didn't tell you that Tom Patton says hi. Well, hello, and Tom. To knowing and not knowing. <laughs> he's, hard, he's hard to forget. You might, you'd have to put a face with a name, but once you did that, you wouldn't forget. <laughs> That's a, that's a good well, he, he wanted me to give you a shout out and, and, and tell you that he's a big fan. Well, thank you. All right, Jody, uh, we will let you go once again. Uh, thanks for your patience. We were running uh, extremely late today. Everybody was kind of no chatting, problem. And, uh, which is great for the show. And uh, like I said, we can go as long as we want. If you've got nothing else, we'll go ahead and let you go. And uh, you can go shine up the TR or whatever you need to do. <laughs> I can do that. I appreciate you guys having me. Um, it's It's been a thrill. It's been a, a crazy couple of weeks trying to actually meet with people and, and talk to some people. And uh, and it, it's just, it's awesome. I, I was uh, thrilled to be able to, to win. And um, I appreciate you guys wanting to talk to me. Absolutely. You're Storm Staffer. You represent our brand great. And uh, maybe you, you will turn into Robin Romeo, and this will just be a, a yearly thing. We'll have you on the show every year, and you'll uh, repeat each year. I will try. All right. Once again, thank you for your patience, and thanks for coming on the show, Jody. Thank you. Bye, everyone. All right. That was Jody Wessner, our anchor person of the show. We have to make sure we say that right nowadays. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, a long show, but a good one. Uh, we, like, As we said, we kind of spent 25, 30 minutes with some people today, but uh, – People had stuff to say, and we had stuff to ask people. So, Luke, yeah. before we go, anything in the in the chat that uh, we want to attack or talk about? I know I threw out a few questions that may or may not have been in there. Yeah, no, there's a, there's a few uh, general comments. I mean, Mister Three Hundred seems like it was just yesterday. I mean, again, that's that's kind of what I grew up with is remembering the the big arena because they were so big. I mean, it was just uh, visually impressive to see thousands of people there and just the four lanes. And it was, it was a very interesting, different kind of thing versus being in the bowling center. Uh, so yeah, that, that's what really stands out to me again, his show and then seeing Tommy Jones come out, uh, Randy Peterson, uh, Jason couch, went in the, the three Pete. I remember that the tournament champions who won three of those in a row, uh, all of those in, you know, or you know, the last one I remember in 
kind of the re- arena finals. But And then uh, just one random question here about, uh, is it true that the USBC is going to exchange balls without having to give yours eventually? I think he's talking about the uh, the storm, the, the, the ball exchange program. No, because it's kind of a different thing with the Spectre that's a full ban across the board. And so by USBC rule, they have to replace all of those, period. Uh, you know, so it's still something you have to go through through the exchange program. But for the for these right now, they're only banned for a few higher level tournaments that the vast majority of us are not going to bowl besides nationals. And at that point, most people probably just, well, just going to leave the balls at home and not worry about it. Um, but the reason they're doing the exchange on the balls is because it's a voluntary thing. It's not something that they're required to do by law, USBC rule, whatever else. You can still use these balls in all your regular tournaments, leagues, whatever else. But should you want to exchange them anyway, they're giving you that option. But they do ask in that situation that you return the balls that you're exchanging to them. Or, you know, in the Spectre situation, they're letting you keep it because... All you can really do is bull practice, cosmic, whatever else. You can't really keep using it. Now, in the situation of this, where you can keep using these balls, it would be, I know, I, I think it'd be kind of unfair to just, you know, have them send you another ball for free when you can keep using the balls that you already have in the vast majority of situations. So um, I, I, I I think that, yeah, it's just you're going to have to, if you choose to exchange through the voluntary program right now, you're going to have to send them the ball that you already have. All right. Well, that's good stuff. Send your cards and comments to Luke Rostall at, uh, well, I won't give that out, but yeah, Luke has uh, had, had a fun week. Let's hope, let's hope for a little less news in the bowling world next week along those lines and a little more along the positive bowling lines and what we saw today on the show with Brad Miller and, and Simo and, and Norm Duke and everything. So let's, uh, let's put a bow on this one, Luke. Uh, once again, we want to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, start start with Storm Bowling, of course, BobbyJacksons.com, Turbo Grips, Double J's Pro Shop, Cool Wick, Bowler's Mart, and SR BBFS. SR BBFS. Storm Rotor Grip Bowling Balls for Sale. We should have a contest. How many of the letters I can get out before I Yeah, and how many can you say it 10 times fast? I cannot. And I really hope that when you get a chance, you can edit out the question I asked to Jody of. Why didn't she bowl uh, back in her younger years when she started listing all the times that she did? But I'm pretty uh, sure I don't have the time for that. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it if you made time, but no, that was that was kind of fun. That's stuff uh, that happens that uh, I don't even know. But anyway, that's going to do it for this week. Thanks to everybody. Uh, I also have to throw a shout out to Gabby, my daughter, who's been watching uh, each and every show. So Gabby, hi, and uh, I'll be home in a couple of hours. That uh, some of us have to work in the morning. I do not, but uh, you get past the guard does. dogs. So yeah, we got to get past the guard dogs. I thought mm-hmm. I saw one over there, but uh, <laughs> let's let's wrap this thing up. That's going to do it for episode number five of the Bowlers Show. Uh, check us out each and every week. Of course, if you're here now, you know where it is. It's on Luke Rosedahl's YouTube page, and that's going to do it for the Bowlers Show. I'm Dave Waswell. He's Luke Rosedahl. We will see you next week. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs>